time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. All right, guys, we're back with another episode of Table Talk. Today, my guest is, again, Laura Stackhouse Phelps. I should know the number of the episode that you were on before, but we'll put it in the description so you can go there because I'm not going to go through your whole history and all the other right. kind of stuff before. Been there, done that. We got mm -hmm. other stuff to talk about. The Laura is, you know, a powerlifting coach and trainer, has broken 45 all time world records, is the founder of Queen Bee Power, coaches a lot of athletes, is a meat director. Uh, has a cookie business, which we'll talk about, <laughs> which is the, 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 uh, the, which is the exit plan. Um, all right, guys, this is how I use my element packs. I got a few different ways that I use it. So currently just got done training. So post training, I will mix one of the chocolate. This is the chocolate caramel and my oatmeal. I'm more of a half packet guy. So put about a half a packet in there and then stir it around. Then it adds that salty chocolate taste to it. If for some reason I'm using chocolate protein in my oatmeal, then I won't put that in there. I'll put a half pack in my coffee, which I'm not gonna do now but the chocolate mocha is really good in the coffee. And then for training, <clears throat> when I trained earlier today, it's simply, my favorite is the grapefruit salt. Pretty much just a, you know, a half pack in there. And then kind of reseal the packs and then put them in. And then, so for training, you know, I'll have, a half a pack and then half a pack in the oatmeal. So it's about a pack a day. If I'm sweating really bad during training, then I might use a full pack in there. But the go-to for me is the oatmeal because it's an everyday thing. It takes a very strong individual. I did not work out, but I did scope out the equipment scene there, of course, because I'm a huge purchaser of Elite. Matt Goodwin, the equipment rep, the main equipment rep there, I've known for years, helped us out tremendously. He's part of my dream team, and the bigger you get, the more equipment you're going to need. You got So whether it's a high school, personal training facility, a garage gym, you've got years and years of experience on building these things out and laying them out and designing them and making sure you're buying the things that you need and not necessarily the things that you will never use. He's my guy. And the bigger you get, the more equipment you're going to need, obviously, to outfit these facilities and the more they need to be upkept, the more they need to be replaced. And it actually becomes a problem for us. That doesn't really happen um, without guys like Matt. So myself, Nate Harvey, Chris Bartle, we've got years of experience. Chris and Nate have both been strength coaches, um, business owners. We can help you guys in any aspect of your gym build. So never hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, there's a contact us page on the website. All of our information is on there. You can reach me directly at mgoodwin at elitefts.net. The phone number here is 888-854-8806. And we can answer any questions you guys have. I'm, t I'm talking to him more and more, especially as we continue to grow and expand. and. It's something to consider. So I'm really pumped to have the story come full circle for sure. So feel free to reach out to us at any time. We're always here to help and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Why should anyone join this Discord? Why wouldn't you want to? It's not fake. It's genuine. It's authentic. It's well worth it. The Discord has been nothing short of meeting new people who are incredibly like-minded, giving each other a bunch of ball busting, but also being there to support each other in whatever life throws their way. The best part of it for me has also been able to connect with lifters of all levels, help coach, get coached, and also connect with other new fathers the journey of lifting and trying to balance that out. It's the glue that holds all of us together. A common interest will bring people from different walks of life people who are multi-millionaires, these characters and everything else in between, united under one thing, the pursuit of strength. I think most of us would agree that getting a coach is a great step forward that an athlete can make to make greater progress. But what if you had two coaches? What if you had a whole bunch of coaches and a whole bunch of driven elite level athletes and like-minded people all in your corner trying to make you better? That's exactly what you're gonna get with the Table Talk Discord crew. 
but your 12th Pro-Am is coming up in on the 13th, yep. 14th, is next that right? Saturday so next Sunday. Saturday. So <clears throat> how's that been? I mean, you're not going to sit here. Actually, you know, because this will post before the meet, so you yeah. can't. Yeah, yeah. You can't say, this sucks. <laughs> this you gotta, was terrible. <laughs> yeah, we should have done it after the meet. But, right. you know, how's this one been? Because you moved the date, right? Well, I think last year it was around the same weekend. Okay, okay. Yeah, I was kind of hoping to do it a little bit earlier, but the venue wasn't available. Because uh, to me, weather is always an issue. Like, I want it to be as cold as possible outside because you pack that many people into a building, even though last year they had the air conditioning on. But um, when people are squatting, for mm -hmm. some reason, it just elevates the heat in there. And people were so hot. And they're like, let's open the garage doors. I'm like, I can't. Like, they have the air conditioning on in here. So I'm always wanting it to be as cold as possible. So I'm already looking at the forecast now and I'm like, I can't see that far ahead yet, but I'm mm -hmm. like, don't rise, don't rise. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. <laughs> yeah. How many lifters? We have about 75 on amateur day mm -hmm. and uh, 60 on pro day. Now on the pro day, do you have an idea how many are repeat? I don't actually, that's a, a good question, but a, there are a lot of repeat. We have a lot of people who this is like their seventh or eighth or, you know, they just do it every yeah. single year. They count on doing this one because they enjoy it. Um, so I'm not really sure how many people are repeat, but there are a lot. There are definitely a lot. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of new faces too, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. With, which is your, <laughs> I'm going to put you in the <laughs> corner here. Uh, which is your favorite day? I actually love amateur day. I mean, I love both days, obviously. Like, mm -hmm. um, Pro day is very intense. It's, you know, it's, it's a ton of excitement, but it's very intense. And then amateur day is so fun. Like the girls, I mean, they're just so appreciative to be there. You know, sometimes it's their first meet. So you've got a lot of people that have been there, you know, multiple years that are encouraging those newer lifters. Uh, the energy is just really fun on amateur day. So I always um, recommend to people, like if it's, you know, your first meet ever, like this would be the best experience to have because mm -hmm. it's all women. So you're going to have so much support, like nobody's, you know, I don't know. Everybody's just super supportive of each other. So everybody's cheering for each other. You just don't really see that a lot of, at a lot of competitions. Mm -hmm. So I, the energy is a lot lighter and um, super fun on amateur day. How many, how many of your own lifters do you have in it? Uh, a total between the two days, I think I have 22. How do you handle that? That's really hard. I mean, I, I tell, I have about three that I actually handle like mm -hmm. wrap knees and do all that. But other than that, like they all, you know, have their own handlers and I just try to work the room, you know, help them with calling attempts and, and anything that they need. But it's definitely hard. I feel like I'm running in a circle the whole time because the the way it's laid out, like the the warm up area is on the far left. You've got the the platform in the center and then the scoring table to the right. So it's just like I'm going from um the warm up area to the platform to see someone lift, then helping them call the number over here and then making a big circle around. So I just am just doing laps all day. And then as you're coming back around though, somebody's grabbing you because you have to oh, deal totally. with things that are like, going hey, on with how the are meat. You? Exactly. Well, that yeah, too, right? right? right. <laughs> so you got the celebrity thing going on. And then you have people saying we just ran out of ice or exactly, whatever it's gonna yeah, be. Totally. So it's total chaos the right, whole time. Right. Luckily, you know, as the years have gone on, I've tried to put a lot of good people in place so that like if something happens, it's not like calling for Laura over the mic, you know, there's a lot of people that can take care of it so that, you know, I'm not the one, the person, the go-to person for every single thing. Mm -hmm. So, and Leah Reichman, she's going to help me a lot this year. She's, you know, not doing the, the meet this year, but she's going to help out kind of doing like odds and ends and like that and stuff like that. But she'll be judging some as mm -hmm. well. But. Is she running her own meet too? Yeah. So yes. I used to host the North of the Border for, I think, 11 years. And I just was like, I just need to focus on one meet a year. Cause this is, it just felt like it was just all year long. It was meat planning. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was like, she had interest in running a meet. So I was like, here you go last mm -hmm. year, two, 2023. And she ran it in November and did a great job. So now that's, it's her thing. Now, when she was out here, she noted that she's retired, Yeah, you know, so yeah. I, I kind of always take that with a grain of salt with any lifter that just retires, but it, it seemed for real. Yeah. Um, because you worked with her for so long and you've been around so many lifters that have come up and exited, right. you know, for lack of a better word. <clears throat> How are you able to help her manage that? Because it is a change. You went through it. Right. I mean, it's a complete change of identity and you yeah. don't know what the hell's going on. Totally. So how are you able to help her manage that? I mean, I kind of knew, um, I could kind of tell a little bit, even before she did the last meet last year, I could tell that like she was, it was in her mind, you know, the thought was in her mind, but not so much that I thought it was going to affect how she would perform last year. I think, um, 
in her mind, she was thinking like, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling the effects of training and just the burnout. And, um, I think she knew that like, if she hit her goal, that that would be it. you know, of course it's hard because so many people are, you know, coming up to you afterwards or in your inbox being like, Oh, squat a thousand, and, mm -hmm. you know, total, whatever, you know, whatever's next. It's like, there's always going to be more. And so I, I remember telling her, I was just like, I felt the same way. Like when I, when I knew in my mind that this, you know, I, I'd come to the end, of course I was like, Oh, I, you know, I should squat 800 or I want to bench 600. There's always like more that you could do, but like, if you feel satisfied with what you did and that's, and that's, was your goal and you feel satisfied and you can walk away with it from it, like, just do it, you know, just do it and don't listen to anybody, you know, don't let anybody influence you. You do what you want to do. And, um, cause I knew that in her heart that, that, that was it, mm -hmm. that she felt good about what she did and wanted to kind of, um, get out while she was ahead, you know, injury free and be able to start, you know, helping. She start, had started like working with athletes in the high school level and doing stuff like that. And in training would have gotten in the way of pursuing things that she was interested in. Mm -hmm. So I just knew I was like, it's, I, I don't, I don't want people to keep training if their heart's not in it, you know, it's not safe, you know, trying to get under loads like that when you're, you know, not feeling it and you're just feeling pressured to do it by everybody else. It was just, it just wouldn't be you know, safe. And then, then what you're just going to start like going down and you well, know. that's yeah. why I'm asked because we've seen this, right? right? What were, what were the factors that led to you retiring? Uh, I had started training with, you know, my training group had started to grow and I just found myself like more interested in what they were doing. You know, I was like, I knew I was like, what am I, I, I did personal training, but I was like, I, just kind of felt myself organically getting into powerlifting coaching, even though I wasn't like, Oh, that's my life's goal. It just, it just was happening organically. And I just found myself having more joy doing that. And I wouldn't have had the time or the energy to put into that many other people if I was like, so focused on my own training. So it just, it just kind of like, it was a feeling that I had where I was just like, I did the last meet that I did wasn't necessarily, and it's not like I went out on a, on a bang, like the last meet that I had was, it was okay. But, um, I just had this feeling when I was there, I was just like, if I, you know, I'm, I'm happy with everything I've done, but if I keep, I feel like if I keep going, like then, yeah, I will be that person that's just like, like, Oh, like bad meat after bad meat. You know, I just could feel that coming and I just felt good. I was like, I, I've done everything that I want to do and I'm injury free and I'm still pretty young. So I can, you know, I have a lot of years so I can put ahead of me towards other people. Mm -hmm. Have there been lifters that you've had to have conversations with in regards to you think that they should be done, <laughs> but they don't want to be done? There, There's a couple, but really like so many people are so new to the sport now. Like there's been a couple though that, yeah, it's like, ugh, it's hard to watch. You know, it's painful. It looks painful and, you know, I got to give it to them. I mean, it's, they keep at it and if it's what they love, it's mm -hmm. fine. You know, if, if you find joy in that, then that is wonderful, you know, but it's, it, it can be hard to watch for sure. Mm -hmm. With the last time you were out here, we talked about training quite a bit, but I want to go a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to go super basic, right? <laughs> and we'll start with how would you define conjugate or West Side Conjugate? Because there's conjugate, there's West Side Conjugate, and there's, you know, all different types of definitions of conjugate. Right, right. So how would you define what you would consider your version, which is a West Side version of conjugate? Right. How would you define that? You know, in one word, I would say variety, you know, mm -hmm. it's variety and training. There's, you know, we all know that with the conjugate system, with the West side conjugate system, it's this, you know, max effort days, dynamic effort days, but with, it's about the variety of the, the movement and not, you know, you know, there's linear, there's so many different training methods, but with conjugate, what I love about it and what I think the people that train with me or do the West side conjugate system that they love is that there's so much variety. Um, you know, people put so much pressure on themselves to hit, you know, hit PRs and, you know, but there's so much variety that I can say, let's do, I can have a whole year of training without repeating a single movement, you know, mm -hmm. and still get stronger. You know, it depends on where someone's at in their training, whether they're in off season or meat prep. But if we're in the off season, someone's just building strength. Cause I have plenty of people that I coach that don't have any aspirations of competing. So they're just doing this to stay strong, stay healthy, stay athletic. So you know, and that's another thing that I love about the conjugate system is that it's, it builds athletes. It's not a system for power lifters. It's a system for athletes. That's why Louis developed it. It was technically for athletes. We just adapted towards whatever sport someone's in. So for powerlifting, you know, you know, there, it is somewhat limited to, um, 
as far as the movements go, we're squatting, benching, and deadlifting, mm -hmm. but we can do a lot of different things, a variety in the max effort movements to keep things from needing to deload, you know, so we can, you know, what I like to do is add in good mornings on max effort lower days so that it's um, a way to, you're not gonna be able to good morning unless you're burly hawk as much, yeah, yeah, as much yeah. as you can like squat or deadlift. So it's a way to kind of throw in a, like a third week of training. That's somewhat of a deload, you know, and, and so it's set up in a way of, it, there's a lot of recovery built into it. So, I mean, it's been, I mean, it's been so much experimenting in the last 10 years that I've been like basically coaching people. It's like, okay, can people handle doing this without having any type of, the only time I ever program a deload for someone is if we're trying to peak for a competition mm -hmm. or if someone just has things in their life where they're not recovering, whether they're, you know, losing sleep, stressed out, things are going on in their life that are causing them to not be able to recover, then yeah, then we'll throw in a deload. But like what, what I love about it and what I, what the people that I coach love about it is that there is so much variety in the max effort movements on, you know, squat, bench, deadlift. Um, and then the dynamic effort days, building that speed work, building the athleticism, um, is just people that love to train. I think love conjugate, you know, people that love to train cause there's so much, there's so much accessory work. So, um, there's a lot of benefit to it because they're going to build a, you know, good physique as well. So people love that they get more muscular and, um, more athletic and faster and stronger and more conditioned. Now you've done dozens, if not hundreds of seminars about this. Uh, what, what are the things that you see people misunderstand about conjugate? So a lot of times when people are like, I, I tried it and it didn't work for me, then I'll be able to ask a series of questions that can narrow down what yeah. went wrong. A lot of that, um, a lot of times happens on dynamic effort day. So they're using too much weight. So they're basing their, um, their percentages off of weights that are way too high. So a lot of times when people, I'll see them doing their, their speed work, like say their box squats and they're super slow, they're super slow. And I'm like, what number did you base this off of? And <laughs> a lot of times what it is, is they'll be basing it. They'll just say like, well, you know, they're using the right percentage and it felt light and they're like, so I needed to go heavier. They mm -hmm. just want to work hard, which I appreciate. Like you want to work hard and you want to feel like you're moving heavy weight, but they forget the fact that it's supposed to be fast. You're supposed to be building speed. You're supposed to be moving it as fast as possible. So they end up putting too much weight on, on for dynamic effort, especially on lower day. And you know, your, your mind, your central nervous system doesn't know the difference between a max effort day, you know, on Monday, a max effort, day on Wednesday for upper. And then now you're moving a, a, a load that's too heavy, you know, so your mind's thinking, okay, max effort again on Friday. Mm -hmm. So they're like, oh, I just like started going backwards. It's like, well, yeah, like you couldn't, there's no way you could recover from something like that. So using too much weight on speed work is usually a big mistake that people make. And then, um, you know, so volume is an issue there, but volume is also, also an issue a lot of times on max effort days as well, upper and lower. So what people will do is what I find is they do way too many sets. Like they're taking, you know, way too many attempts to get to that one rep max instead of, you know, I always give people, my people like the limit of seven to nine total attempts from set one to the final set, mm -hmm. you know, so that's why it's important to log your training because if you do have that much variety and you're not logging what your previous PRs were, you have no clue. You don't go into the, the training day with a plan. So that's, you know, another mistake people make is they have no plan at all. They just go in and start throwing weight on the bar with no plan whatsoever. So then that would, that's what would cause them to either take way too many attempts to get to the max because they didn't have a plan. They don't know what their previous PR was, or sometimes they'll take too few. They'll plate, plate, Mm -hmm. plate quarter, three plates miss, mm -hmm. you know, something like that. So they're, the volume is either not enough or, um, too much on max effort days. So going in with a plan and making sure that, you know, what your previous PR was, that's, that's a hundred percent. That's what we're going for is that, you know, if you've been doing this a long time, you're just going for a five pound PR mm -hmm. typically. Um, so that five pound PR is your hundred percent. And then having seven, even if you, you know, did like eight, you know, meet in the middle, eight total attempts to hit that 100% and then three attempts at or above 90%. So like whatever those first five, you know, uh, warmups are, and then at one attempt at 90, one attempt at 95 or 97%. And then that one, that final attempt at hundred percent, which would be your five pound PR. So laying it out like that just helps you to, you know, just control the volume 
and control your time as well. You know, because a lot of times people will spend so much time working up to that max. I mean, I'm talking like an hour and a half mm -hmm. hitting that max and that leaves no time or energy to do the accessories. So that's a mistake again, yes. is too much effort and intensity that people put into the ma the main movement. You know, they, they think it's like a meat day, you know, so they're just like getting crazy amped up, you know, hitting the smelling salts, doing all this stuff to hit that, that max. And then like then they all of a sudden they they come down off of that high and they're just like I don't want to do any yeah. accessories or I'll just do a couple push downs or leg curls and then I'm out of here. But it's like well if you only did eight total attempts and you know have that much volume, you don't have you didn't do anything else to get stronger. Like you, you that was just a tester. You didn't do anything mm -hmm. to build your strength. You know so that's a huge mistake people make is putting way too much effort and intensity. Just hit that. Just work up. Hit that PR. And then shut it down and move on to accessories. Like really, especially as a raw lifter that doesn't have to get into the gear and stuff, you should be able to hit that eighth attempt in 30 minutes, you know, because those first four or five warm up sets can be done in less than 10 minutes. You know, you mm -hmm. don't really, you know, it's light. You don't really need a ton of rest periods. And then you can take those last, you know, four attempts and, you know, spread them out. But still, you could be done in 30, 40 minutes and then still give yourself an, another hour to do to put your effort into accessory work and actually put effort into the accessory work. You know, that's another mistake people make mm -hmm. is that there's no effort in accessory work. They're just kind of like going through the motions. You know, I know this or I do a lot of uh, program programming for people remotely. And, you know, I'll hear from other people that see them train, you know, they'll be like, oh, they kind of like just kind of half-ass the accessories and, or don't do them, you know, very much, or they're chit-chatting through it and not really, you know, doing them or putting any intensity into them. And, and then like, they wonder if, why they're not making any progress, you mm -hmm. know? So I kind of like went through all those pretty fast, but I could like really listen. No, I mean, the max, effort, <laughs> the max effort one's an interesting one because it's, it's tricky Yeah. because you, you may have somebody that does a max effort movement and it just wipes them out because yeah. some do you know it yeah. happens sometimes and they're just shot right so then they make the call you know i'm done which yeah. is probably the right call if it's yeah. that bad but then the next time they come back they feel great yeah so then after two or three times of just axing all the accessories like, oh, i felt good so they I feel good yeah. and they're breaking prs yeah then they're just like well i'm going to quit doing it yeah. and then it all begins to fall because totally. their work capacity fell right and they don't realize that yeah. and with the accessory part i've joked with other people that it would be interesting and i probably don't even want to do it with myself if i'm training with a crew to stick a phone up in the camera and film your whole session yeah like just <laughs> two hours whatever it's going to be just and then go back and watch yourself right are you really training hard or are yeah. you socializing just fucking around yeah and usually what you'll find is in the first movement you know once they get warmed up that's on point and then if they were to watch themselves, they'd be like, what the hell? Yeah. You know, that was like 12 minutes between sets. <laughs> right, that was right. 60 seconds between yeah. sets. I didn't even, it, it's crazy to think about. And now that I've said that so many times when I'm training, I ask myself, like, if there was somebody filming me right now, would I be like, if this was yeah. live stream, would they be like, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but the the speed work as well is what I've seen people screw up. That's mm -hmm. definitely I'm, I'm. You said it first, probably for a reason, because that's always the one. Right. It's like what you know. It's like eighty percent of their projected max in the next three meets. Yeah. I mean, it's like totally. So it's they're yes. basing it off of a huge number. That's you know a goal in the future, and you know and the weight's moving slow. So it's just sort of like. It doesn't, or some people, if they're doing proper technique, might be basing the number properly, but they're, they just don't have the technique or the hip strength, hamstring strength yet. So they're, it's moving slow. So it's just like, there's nothing wrong with like bringing it down, bringing it to a good level until you're actually moving it fast and moving it properly and then start, you know, bumping it up to the right percentage. But, you know, there's just too much ego there. Sometimes people just want to make sure, I don't know. And I guess they're just trying not to leave any cards on the table. They're making sure they cover all their bases, but you actually do a lot better if, you know, by moving the bar fast enough. I think if they think about it is in other protocols, you'll have heavy days, moderate days, and light days. If yeah. they think of this as like the max efforts, their heavy day. Mm -hmm. And then this dynamic is their light to moderate yeah. day. Right. So if it's Chico or whatever it is, they're still uh, undulating periodization right. within that training week. Yeah. And 
even with the old protocols, they wouldn't do a heavy day in a heavy day. Yeah. I mean, very few people can get away yeah, with that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and if they did, it would be like Monday's heavy, Wednesday's light, Friday's heavy. Yeah. yeah. And still most can't get away with that either. Right. Yeah. And we're trying to do a heavy day on Monday and a heavy day on Wednesday. You know, which granted it's totally yeah. different body parts, but yes, it's still, you know, that's, you still have that load that's that stress, you know, so having a heavy day on Friday just would not make sense at all. You're just going to go backwards. So, you know, using it as a day for conditioning and for speed and teaching yourself how to move weights as fast as possible is way more beneficial than trying to move some kind of weight in, in some sort of effort, you know? Mm -hmm. So if we break this down, so that's like the basic definition of conjugate, yeah. right? So <laughs> I would say raising different motor abilities at the same time, you know, but it's still variety, yeah. you know, through variety right, would be right, in there. Right. And then it breaks down into the max effort and the dynamic days and then the accessories and supplementals and stuff like that. So with uh, max effort work, you kind of talked about that, like get up to the max as safely and fastly as you can. Yeah. And then from there, how... How do you rotate the movements with your lifters? And it's, it's a broad question. I right. get that. So right. cover like uh, somebody you're just starting working with and may, as more of a beginner. Yeah. Because maybe there's going to be less variation. I yeah. don't know. And then into the advanced. But how would you vary that movement? Um, if someone's a beginner, no matter what, like I, I try to keep the accessories well-rounded. So if it's a lower body day, we're going to have a movement for spinal erectors, a movement for hamstrings, you know, so that it's not just like all, all of our accessories today are just hamstrings. You know, I try to keep it very well-rounded, but if someone's a beginner, a lot of times I'll have them do three weeks of the same accessory. So we're, we're you know, so I'm talking about the max effort movement. Yeah. Max okay. effort. Yeah. Okay. So I thought you're talking about accessories. No, we'll get to that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the um, max effort movement itself. Yeah. So we'll keep it more basic. If someone's new, I won't, I won't put like a bunch of specialty bars with chains and bands pulling from the front and stuff like that. It's, it's a lot more basic movements, you know, a front squat, back squat. Um, you know, I do, I would like them to use a, you know, maybe a safety squat bar, you know, cause it's, I don't know, just, it's going to work their spinal erectors more, take pressure off the shoulders, things like mm -hmm. that. But as, as, as far as variety goes, that'd be like the limit of variety. Um, and then, you know, it's still doing some good morning, teaching that movement pattern, but, um, no, yeah. the beginners stay with the same movement more than one week. Mm, no, no, I still try to vary, just keep it varied. Mm -hmm. Um, but if someone's in it now, we're breaking it into like, if someone's a raw lifter and equipped, lifter, most likely I'm, someone's not coming to me as a beginner in mm -hmm. equipment. Yeah, so yeah. most likely they're a raw lifter. So that's where I would work, do some percentage work on those days as well. As far as like, I like to, I, I'm a big fan of the box squat. Okay. Yeah. And, um, so on dynamic effort day. So that's why I will do some some volume work on, on the max effort days with a raw lifter with, especially a beginner where it's just, we're just doing some reps at, you know, in the 70% range, you know, in between those days of doing some sort of like three rep max or two rep max. So we kind of save the one rep maxes, you know, for, you know, once they're a little bit further along in the program, but as a newer lifter, just keeping the variety to volume work, basic, basic max effort movements. Um, but more so than anything, it's just more accessory work for them because they right. just have to build a so foundation. If, for so. example, they'd have a max effort movement, pin poles or whatever yeah. for week one and then week two. It would be their basically competition squad or deadlift yeah. for reps in week three going back to good mornings or some other. Yeah, maybe effort. good mornings or maybe some volume work then, you know, at 70-ish percent for the squat. You know, just just keeping things a little bit more basic for them. Um, and focusing more on accessories. Now, nobody's really going coming to me as like never having, n having no mm -hmm. base whatsoever. The people are usually coming to me that ha they have a base of lifting. They just might not be familiar with power lifting. So doing the basic barbell movements is really important. So doing a lot of volume from the floor on, on the dynamic effort day though, like I, I focus more on teaching them. I do have, um, I don't want to call them beginners, like I said, because they usually have a base, but box squatting is important. I tried to, you know, building the spinal erectors, building the glutes, hamstrings as a way to build their squat, but also to build their deadlift. So on that day on, on, they might be doing volume deadlifts or might be speed work. I try to vert rotate between the two, you know, classic speed work, teaching them how to move the bar fast, um, against like a light, light band, just teaching them how to move the bar fast. But on those days we would do some sort of volume as well. Um, kind of rotating between the two for just, you know, just their normal competition stance deadlift. So that way on the max effort days, you know, we're going to be focusing more on like max effort movements for deadlift rather than 
like doing volume for deadlift on those days. So squ- that, that's more of a squat and good morning day for me on Mondays, um, squat and good mornings. And then a, an occasional like max effort, um, variation for a deadlift for someone who's newer and it might be from the floor. It might be, um, deficit deadlifts or like a pin pull or block pull, but keeping it pretty basic for, for those max effort movements for deadlift. But, um, it'd be more of like working on the squat and, you know, the occasional good morning, good morning Mm -hmm. to just kind of like, as like an accessory type of day. So if I'm understanding, if it's that demographic that we're talking about, that volume work is not going to be on top of or after their max effort work, it's going to be in place of right. yeah. on every yeah, other yeah. week or however yeah, exactly. it falls. Okay. Right, right. Um, because that would be, I've seen others mm-hmm. that will do, you know, the max effort work and then the volume work yeah. either of that max effort exercise or of one of the main lifts. Yeah. Right. Which I'll after do that. Like if someone's like further along and they're kind of, you know, their technique is good and they're ready to, for a little bit more Then yes, it will turn into like max effort variation with downsets. So the downsets yeah. are in the 70 to 80% range of that movement that they did that day. So that's majority of my people are in that range right there. They're doing the, the max effort movement with downsets of that movement, movement and then going into accessories. Now with those downsets of those people, do you, granted the movement changes, mm-hmm. do you periodize the downsets. So say 70% for five week one, then maybe 74% or 72% for week two, but it's still a different move. You get what I'm saying? It's it's still based off a different movement, but it's not always that same percent. It kind of pulls up. Right. So yeah, you can definitely do it that way so that it, yeah, it waves sort of like the dynamic effort Mm -hmm. days do like in a three week wave in that, in that way. But that's about the extent I wouldn't like do a full on like periodization where it's like 60, you know, and then 62, you know, all the way up to the nineties, it'd be staying in that, in that range of 70 to 80%, but just kind of waving a little bit. Do you program it that way or do you, what I'll do is if I'm watching somebody and they do their max effort work and I know they've fallen in the dem- demographic we're talking about, yeah. they need to do down work. So I'm watching that movement to kind of figure out how much it's taking out of them right. to determine in my brain, is it going to be fives or is it going to be threes? Yeah. Exactly. That's ideally like, I think that's why people are like, oh, the, the hive girls, the hive girls um, at, at the gym yeah. where I train at. And it's like, well, I'm there with them. I can make like yeah. calls like that, like, cause I'm seeing them. I'm not always with all my remote people and being able to, to regulate like that, you mm-hmm. know, but ideally it would be like that where it's um, being able to say like, I know it says three by three at 80% today, but like, let's do, let's go down a little bit. Let's do 70% for three by five. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's much harder to do that, like from afar. So. No, I totally yeah. get that. <laughs> you know, it's just, I don't know, because <laughs> we'll get into how you teach people how to auto-regulate themselves because that's plays into this because yeah. they kind of should know yeah. if they do it long enough yeah. and you should kind of know after that max effort last set, Yeah, like that was a lot. Right. You right. know, it's, that was, it not, took a lot not there today, yeah. right? <laughs> Which to me would be, okay, we're, it's fives. Yeah. And then it's just a matter, is it 70 or 80%? Or not at all. Yeah, or, or not, or just, not at all. Yes. Yeah. Or not at all. Yeah. But if it's five pound PR, you mm-hmm. felt good. Yeah. You might've been able to do another one. Yeah. Save it and do 80%. Yes. Yeah. See, I think that would be a better call right. instead of trying to chip again, yeah. you know, to get some of that work in there. Right. With 80, 85% Mm -hmm. or whatever it's going to be. For sure. Uh, From there, and with staying on the max effort, what what are you looking for, or how do I want to ask this? Why is the max effort in the program? So you're giving a seminar and you're talking about the max effort method. Why should people do the max effort method? Well, I have experimented with people when I, when... For a long time, it was like, okay, everybody in the gym, we're all doing the conjugate system, like the traditional conjugate system, only box squatting on, and and this is when raw started Mm -hmm. becoming popular. So like half the gym's raw, half the gym's equipped now. And it's just like, but everybody's doing the same traditional program. And then what I found was the raw lifters were just super out of practice of squat of just like narrow stance mm-hmm. squatting they just had been doing so much box squatting and and very you know they're only doing a max effort squat variation once every three to four weeks you know so they just were super out of practice mm-hmm. on squatting so i kind of experimented with doing way more of like kind of like volume like periodization and um what i found was like yeah they felt 
stronger in reps, but they just now squatting a one rep max felt completely foreign. You know, they just did not know how to strain mm -hmm. and get through and struggle through a lift and, and kind of think your way through a lift that there's something to be said for that is learning how to, to one rep max, even if it's a variation mm -hmm. and not just a straight up squat bench or a deadlift, like you're still teaching your body, your, your central nervous system, like thinking your way through a lift. So I can't think that's what we were missing. So now I'm trying to do like a very blended approach to both of those so that there is volume and building, you know, a deadlift and a squat and a bench, but, um, always keeping those max efforts and just, you know, they're just so important for teaching you variety. Like when we do so much variety, we do use different specialty bars, chains, things like that to overload the top on certain variations. Certain bars will work your triceps. Certain bars will work your, you know, spinal erectors more than a straight bar would. So the purpose of max effort is not only to learn how to strain, but also to kind of work those different angles, the different things, you know, your weaknesses and maybe your weaknesses, you know, my spinal rectors are weak. So we're going to do a lot of like squat variations with a, a camber bar, um, or my triceps are weak. So we're going to do football bar, you know, with a ton of chain or something like that, you know, so, or dead presses today for max effort, you know, to teach yourself how to push your body away from the, the, the bar, basically, instead of pushing the bar away from you, you know, if, if you're struggling, you just have to think like, if I'm struggling with this movement, you know, or this thing about my bench press or something like that, you know, how can I, what kind of variation can I pick that's heavy max effort that will help me to learn how to do it the way I'm supposed to, you know? So just trying to think your way through, um, is kind of how I see the importance of max effort. Yeah. Well, I think yeah. you nailed it with that is the ability to <clears throat> think through mm -hmm. the straining yeah. because it's, it's one of those things where if you ask, you know, even an advanced lifter and it's a top set yeah. or in, even in a meet, um, and it slows down and you ask them like what happened, they kind of should be able to tell you. Right. Right. And because your your brain slows down mm -hmm. when it's it it's, should. It seems like it's 20 seconds long, but it really is happening so quickly. But it's so fast, you're but you're processing. Think, yeah. But if you're still in that phase where all your brain is doing is ah, you know, just <laughs> right, screaming right. or oh shit, or you know, whatever signals come until you learn how to kind of control that. Yeah. Then you don't know. Right. Where there there there's that point to where time slows down. Mm -hmm. But not only does it slow down, but your kinetic awareness yeah. or kinesthetic awareness yeah. <laughs> is my hips aren't in the right spot. Right. I got to push my knees out or yep. whatever that correction is, yeah. you know, because there's too much strain on maybe your erectors yeah. and not your glutes. So, yeah. you know, and I don't know how you learn that <laughs> without doing, without doing max effort. Yeah. yeah. Max effort work. And not only that, but max effort work, like chaotic max, effort, like mm -hmm. max effort work that throws you out of position. Yeah. Suspended sure. good mornings. Good mornings. Exactly. I mean, good morning is just a really bad squat. Yeah. Like, so that, that's what happens know, if you're going to miss. raw lifters. I'm like, you should be doing heavy good mornings because yeah. you will get into a position where you are folded over and you have to really strain to to move that weight and you better have a strong back and strong abs. Like, And so a lot of that can, you, you can teach yourself that with heavy good mornings. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's like, all you have to do is just say, what what is happening when I fail a lift and what kind of movements can I do to help correct that? What would be your core max effort movements for lower body? So I mean, I usually like if someone's in off season, we rotate between one week one is a good morning variation. So we, every time we do a good morning variation, it's different. It could be the giant camber bar. It could be the safety squat bar. Um, it could be against chains. It could be bands pulling from the front. Um, we try to vary those all the time and we always work up to like a three rep max, not never really a one rep mm -hmm. max, um, with some down sets on those and then into accessories. And then week two would be a deadlift variation. So again, we could do sumo conventional i have a lot of people do in the off season especially whatever your competition stance do the opposite stance because it really helps build the uh, each other like and vice versa so doing opposite comp competition stance would be a variation mm -hmm. you know so that's even if you had no access to chains and specialty bars and things like that just 
opposite competition stance, you know, and then you, and then beyond that, you've got deficits, different level of deficits, three inch, two inch, one inch, or block pools, same thing, one inch, two inch, three inch block pools. And then with both of those, you know, a deficit or block pools, then you can start adding bands or chains, mm -hmm. you know, and doing it on, on those as opposed to just straight up from the floor, depending on maybe you have a weak point. Like I know some people who are really good off the floor, but not good on blocks. You would think like off of blocks, I should be really good, but some people are the, the opposite. So it's like, okay, let's work those, you know, let's work those levels of block pulls. Cause obviously you've got like kind of a sticking point there. Um, and vice versa. I know some people are really good on deficit and not so much, mm -hmm. you know, from the floor or, or higher, you know, so it's doing variations like that reverse bands on deadlift. I mean, like I said, I could literally go through a whole year of doing it for doing that three week rotation, a whole year of variety of all, on all three lifts without repeating the same thing, you know, now granted that's great for someone who's, like I said, if they're just endlessly in the off season or just someone who doesn't compete, but obviously people are competing sometimes, you know, two, three times a year. So therefore the variety starts to go down because we start to realize that these are the, these are the movements that work for this person as a tester. Um, you know, we, we don't need to do, um, a log press today, mm -hmm. you know, because yeah. it's something fun for variety for upper, for upper body. You know, we need to stick, you know, stick to the, the movements that are good testers for them. These are the movements that when they hit a PR, I know they're going to hit a PR in the meet. So it starts to become your variety starts to go down the more seasoned you are as a lifter, you know? So if it's off season, we try to have fun, do a lot of variety, a lot of, you know, things to help build your weaknesses. But when it comes time to, as we're getting approaching a competition or getting into competition season, then those, those movements, that variety starts to really pare down. Now, when you see the <clears throat> disconnections, you know, they're stronger on pulling from a deficit than they are the floor. And outside of short arms or, you know, whatever right, leverages. Leverage, <laughs> leverages they could be contending with, what does that tell you? I mean, sometimes it's not a problem, you know, like it, all that matters is what you're pulling from the floor. It just, it would be like, okay, if, if you, you have to kind of look at what their sticking points are. So if someone has a sticking point at their knee, then, okay, we'll, we'll do some stuff from blocks. If someone has a sticking point from the floor, then let's do some, some more work from a deficit. Um, sometimes people just really struggle just to move weight off the ground. Like it might not even be something that they, we need to vary the, the height of the bar. It might, a lot of times that just means they have weak abs. Are you, are you doing your ab work? That's another <laughs> mistake I can mm -hmm. add to the list with like, not just conjugate, but training in general is how many, how few people actually train their abs and train them hard. You know, that's a huge part of, of lifting, you know, is, is your core strength. So sometimes people literally, I get it. It's, it's you typically at the end of a workout and people are tired and like, mm -hmm. what's the easiest thing to skip is, is ab work, you know, so doing heavy ab work and, um, good mornings will help you move weight off the ground a lot faster, you know? So it's like, um, it's kind of, I kind of lost like where I was yeah. going. Well, with when that, you say but, heavy ab work, what are you talking about? Like weighted ab work. So I do a lot of decline, like zercher sit ups and a lot of decline heavy ab work, you know, standing. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I, I try to have like four days of ab work, you know, four, four main days, you know, so one day might be this is super low rep, heavy, heavy ab work. So let's say it is that zercher, uh, decline zercher sit up. It's like an eight rep max heavy as you can. <clears throat> I have a day for obliques, you know, because you want to, I just want to keep the, the core work yeah. well-rounded. So oblique work one day for static ab work. So plank variations, GHD face up, you know, inverted planks, um, you know, holds different things like that. It's just static ab work, hollow rocks, things like that, that are, they're static. And then one day for just repetition ab work. So, you know, people that love to do the, the rope crunches yeah. or the banded crunches, you know, things that are more for repetition ab work that way you kind of hit everything and, and don't just leave it up to just saying like, what do I feel like doing today? Cause you'll always pick your favorite thing or you nothing. Know? <laughs> or nothing. Yeah. All right. Exactly. Yeah. So <clears throat> moving on to, I think that covered everything with the max effort, moving on to the dynamic effort work. Um, what are the advantages to doing that or the benefits of doing it in general? Again, you're teaching the seminar. Right. So, yeah, yeah. Why, <laughs> you know, why do dynamic work? I mean, there's so many reasons, but I think it's one of the most if not the most important day, because it's teaching you how to move weights fast. Like it's funny because Leo, you know, Reichman was on your podcast recently. And, um, how many people that I know that I coach that were literally like, okay, I, Leah said, we need to move the bar as fast as possible. So that's what I thought about today. And I hit, I did this and it was so good. And I was like, you didn't know you're supposed to move the bar fast, you know, like, so how many people just kind of don't really understand the importance of moving 
the bar as fast as possible. So that's kind of the, the sole purpose behind dynamic effort work, you know, being more explosive, you know, more athletic, um, more force production. So that day is kind of what that's for. So it translates to, because obviously in max effort movements too, we're trying to move the bar as fast as mm -hmm. possible. It's obviously not going to look like speed work, but in, but you know, speed is power. So it's like, we're trying to move heavy weights as fast as possible. So the best way to do that is to practice under submaximal load. So doing that on dynamic effort day is incredibly important. Keeping your rest period short to build GPP. That's another mistake I can say that people make with, um, with training conjugate is their dynamic effort day ends up taking really long too. Um, um, you know, I've told this story a lot, but like, you know, Louis, he came down to the gym. This is so many years ago. And Phil Harrington and I, he had us, he was doing a video for the combine and he had us do dynamic effort work. And it was, he had this like literal clock, like from the wall, like a round mm -hmm, clock sitting mm -hmm. on the floor that people could see. So we, um, they, we, there were people like loading and unloading the weights <laughs> and we had to do one set every 20 seconds, pick up the bar every 20 seconds for 10 doubles. And I mean, I was all like, I'll be fine because I never, I don't rest that long. I didn't, I never timed myself, but I just assumed that I was not resting very long and go right into 10 doubles on the deadlift. Um, and this, and it was heavy. I mean, it was, I think I was using 330 on squat against green bands against average bands. And, um, I think I was using 275 against double mini. So it was like, it wasn't like light. And I it was the hardest thing I've ever done. Hardest. I mean, I've done a lot of CrossFit workouts that was brutal. And I was like, wow, I do. I, that just really opened my eyes to how long I was resting and how, how other people shouldn't be resting quite as long, you know, cause we got through it and 10 minutes or something like that, mm -hmm. both, both the squat and deadlift. So I, I mean, granted, this was a, a video for the combine. So not power lifters are not football players. And we're not really trying to in, you know, mimic a half of a football game. So, um, with power lifters, what I'll usually have them do like, I, cause some people I personal train for powerlifting style. So if I'm actually working with them in person, I, I just have my little tip out of timer here. And depending on the rep scheme, if it's, let's say if we're doing an eight, eight sets of three on speed squats, then we're going to go every 45 seconds, you know, it's just like counts down every 45 seconds. We're going, you know, sometimes less if it's, if it's 12 doubles or 10 doubles, it's every 40 seconds, mm -hmm. you know? So it's, I mean, that gives them plenty of time to, you know, take the belt off or unlatch a belt for a second, like take a breath, go back under. But, um, you know, that's working that conditioning aspect. So it's like for powerlifting, you know, when you want to, we talk about like wanting to get through a meet and not feel tired and you know, what can I do to work my conditioning? It's like, that's one easy way to do it without adding anything else into your training program, you know? So it's like, okay, you don't need to, I'm not telling you to go run a couple mm -hmm. miles or get on the elliptical or anything like that. I'm just saying just shorten your rest periods, at least to like an EMOM, like every minute on the minute is when you should be going. So yeah. when it comes to groups, sometimes people will get into groups of four or five. And even if you guys are moving really fast, I mean, you're probably yeah. going to be going every five minutes at best. So, um, keeping your group small and then, you know, maybe one group, one group is helping the other, like, you know, adjusting the mono, changing the weights if need be, um, while the, in, you know, and then vice versa, that'll, that'll yeah, help. Three people being about yeah. max, assuming there's no weight change. Right. Right. We used to go on the minute, you know, it was the, the clock on the mm -hmm. wall, right? Yep. Spinning hand. clock. Yeah. And what I found was the way to make that easier was right after my set, just stare at the second hand. It seemed like mm -hmm. it was longer. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It does seem it's like. <laughs> Yes, and it's, that was that was a mental trick to be able to because if you didn't do that, it was right back up right, there again. Right. But you know, to to one thing that you said there, if we were pushing, you know, twelve, fifteen sets, the rest period came down. Yeah, you know, so then that would be thirty seconds and right. things like that just sucked. Yeah, but it builds that conditioning. Mm -hmm. it, from my perspective, I'll still put that in if I think the conditioning's falling out. Yeah, it'd be safety squat bar, three plates. Start at 10 sets week one, yeah. 15 sets week two, 20 sets week three. Wow. Take it down to 30 seconds for the week three. It sucks, right. but I don't have to worry about recovery from the squat yeah. for a while after that. Definitely. You know, but it, it sucks. Yeah. But, and it's to your point, though, it's I'm. I want to say impressed, but it's not that um, on how. You know, eight sets of two or eight sets of three can take an hour and a half, mm -hmm. you know, it's, and I, I don't, I, it's, it's just like, to me, it's, I don't know. I've just always loved training, you know? So even when I was competing, it was like, I loved the process of training. Like, you know, I love meat day too. Obviously I want the results, but 
if, um, you know, if, if, you know, God forbid something happened and I didn't do well and I bombed out several times, I, I just never like dwelled. I never thought like, Oh, I need to be doing a different training program. I need a different coach, nothing like that. Like, I just was like, I'm going back to training. I'm going to figure out what I did wrong. Like, like it's on me. Like the accountability is on me. Like what did, you know, what, what went wrong, um, and build on it. Cause I just, I love training. So therefore on a dynamic every day like that, I'm like, I love working out. Like, so yeah, short rest periods, a lot of accessory work, actually pushing myself. I enjoy doing doing that, you know, but I think sometimes people are missing that they, they want the result, but they're not willing to do what it, you know, do yeah. the little things that it takes. Some of the pushback that I'm sure that you've got that I've gotten as well against the dynamic work, but well, there's a lot, but some of the more popular pushbacks would be, you can't develop explosive strength past a certain age. So my answer to that's been, okay, yeah. you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll agree with that, but you can get slower. Right. As you get older. I'm so. trying to minimize like yeah. loss of anything, explosive power, yes. muscle mass, whatever. That's, that's, so if we what can't build yeah. it, then theoretically, wouldn't we be able to maintain, right. you know, exactly. what we've had? But if you didn't do it, then you lose yeah. that ability to uh, produce force yeah. out of the bottom. Then are you not screwed? Right. You know, so that's the first pushback. The other pushback would be okay, let's assume that both of those are just not true. Then it's technical reinforcement you know because right. there's if it's eight or ten sets and it's of two or three each one of those reps is technically as perfect as you can make right. them right. where after three reps if you're doing a set of five most people mentally check out after three yeah i'd say they're probably after two you know so in a set of five they re reinforced more bad technique than good and they only had one or if it's two sets of five they had two first reps yeah yeah. <laughs> or in a meet, this is the first rep. The first rep, yeah. Yeah. Eight to 10 sets, right? You have eight to 10 first reps. Mm -hmm. And the second one's still really, really technical. Yeah. So now you have 20 opportunities to reinforce good technique. Yeah. Versus two sets of three once a week where you have two right. first reps. Right. You know, and now you compound that over a whole training cycle. You're looking at hundreds of technical reps versus you know, a dozen, yeah, maybe, yeah, you know, and that's assuming that you can't develop the force, you can't maintain the force, yes, right, a lot more opportunity yeah. to, yeah, to maintain that and to, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Then the third one would be, um, it's a light day, you know, because usually the people that will critique that will say you should have a heavy and a light day, so it's a light day, so you're able to better recover, yeah, and on a, you can recover better from a box than you can without the box, so we'll just throw that in there for now, right. talk about the box in a minute. Right. So now you got a more effective recovery day that reinforces technique mm -hmm. and it's- Keeps you more athletic. Yes. I mean, like as you get older, like I, I want to stay more athletic. I, I don't want to start to lose capabilities. I want to maintain or even gain capabilities. So I'm not sure why I would just like start pulling things out, you know, that, that I know work. Mm -hmm. What I've said with the box jokingly, but I'm kind of serious about it is- <clears throat> Anytime I've been hospitalized for hip replacement or anything serious, the first thing they ever teach you is a, stand <laughs> is a, is a sit to stand. Yeah. <laughs> you know, get yourself to the end of the bed, put your feet on the floor, stand up. Yeah. So that's a box squat. Yeah. Like that's so re you know, it's, it's so functional. <laughs> yeah. So when I'm on my deathbed, you know, I'll still be able to like slide at the end and die on my feet. Totally. Yeah. Because of the box squat. <laughs> right. So that's how I put that in there. <laughs> With um, your dynamic work, how do you run the waves? So three week waves. Yes. So, you know, t classic West side conjugate. So three week waves of same, same bar, same accommodating resistance. We're just waving the bar weight. So 50, 55, 60, um, you know, 50 for week one, 55% for week two and 50 or 60% for week three. So we're waving it up like that, but keeping the, you know, if there's chains on the bar, so let's say we're doing safety squat bar, um, against, 25% hanging chains. So every week it's going to be safety squat bar against 25% hanging chains. It's just, we're, we're increasing the bar weight by 5% each week. And then the volume comes down on, on week three, when you're at 60% bar weight, then let's say we're doing 12 doubles week one, you know, 12 to 10 to 12 doubles on week two, and then eight to 10 on week three, you know, depending, you know, sometimes I don't know. It just depends on who the person is. Mm -hmm. I might do, do tw you know, classic 12, 12, 10, you know, especially if it's like maybe a newer lifter and they're, they're, they're moving lighter weight and need more, like we said, opportunity to, to do those, you know, technical reps. those reps. Yeah. yeah. Those technical reps. So, um, 
yeah, the, the week, the week goes up on week three, the volume come, the, the reps come down on week three. And then on week four, we start over. So we start over, but we try to change, you know, assuming that you have access to a variety of specialty bars, chains, bands, things like that. Um, then we change it. Even if you don't have access to all that stuff, we still change some variable about, about that three week wave. So, you know, if we just did the three weeks of safety squat bar and chains on week four, now we're coming back down to 50%, but doing giant camber bar with, you know, 25% chains or band tension. And then week two, 55, week three, 60. And then we're just waving it in that, in that same pattern every week. Um, and I keep it pretty, pretty classic like that. Do the percents change based upon the experience of the lifter? So say it's Leah, who's 900 pounds squatter versus somebody that's an intermediate with 185 pounds squat. Actually, if someone's less experienced, I would have them base their percentages off of their one rep max box squat. So not off of their one rep max, normal stance, free squat, competition, anything mm -hmm. like that. Because most people, especially in, in a more beginner and in, intermediate level, cannot box squat nearly what they can um, free squat. So therefore that's where you get into the trouble of using too much weight. I've seen it a million times where, you know, a less experienced lifter will move the bar really slow on their speed work. And I'll say, you know, like, what are you, what are you basing this off of? And they're basing it off of their regular squat stance, one rep max competition squat. And like when you have them do an actual one rep max box squat, um, you know, wider stance, sitting back, um, you know, proper technique, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, it's so much less than what their, their free squat is. So then, you know, then they're just, we're using way too much weight. It's too much of a percentage because they're basing it off of their free squat. Now with someone like Leah, you know, a lot of the bigger guys at Westside, they base it off of their full gear squat because they could actually move that weight fast enough. Um, with enough force, you know, everything and their technique was good. So a lot of times people will, you know, have a more experienced lifter out, you know, can base it, move those weights uh, off of their full gear max, but that's a little, um, a little more rare. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the, the, um, the difference there would be a carryover versus a raw that doesn't have the carryover. Yeah. Yeah. You know, for sure. So. I'd rather them use like weights that are, you know, based off of their one rep. That's why I have people, um, test their one rep max box squat somewhat, not frequently, but like mm -hmm. periodically so that they know what their one rep max box squat is to base their percentages off of for dynamic effort lower rather than keeping it, you know, just lower than just winging it and just kind of. Now, guessing. will you do that as far as a max effort day mm -hmm. or will you just have them work up on the dynamic day if things look really good? Um, not typically on dynamic every day because we have some sort of like variation of like accommodating resistance on resistance mm -hmm. on the bar. So that would be a max effort variation. If it's, if, it, if this is, we, if this week is, you know, the week of the wave, you know, we did good mornings, we did a deadlift variation. This week is a squat variation. Then it might, that's where I would put the one rep max box squat first for, right. um, now when you were out before you were saying on that dynamic day, you have everybody do classic box squat, which I'll have you explain that here in a second. And then if they're raw after that, they would do their regular stance squats. Did I understand that? Oh, no. That, like I would have, that would be on Monday. Okay. Yeah. That'd be a Monday variation, you know, might be volume and might be max effort variation, but that would be typically a Monday thing for them with like their regular stance. Um, but on, on, dynamic. you know, as long as they're doing that on, on the Mondays, then on dynamic effort days, it'd be like more, a little bit wide. I'm not saying like they're going out yeah, as yeah. wide as a geared lifter, but a little bit wider stance to work, work their hips a bit more. Cause what I really want to do with that is not keep them in their stance. That's like narrow or whatever like that. I want to keep, I want to move them out wider to work more of their posterior chain. Cause what I found is that it really, um, works the deadlift if they do that. Like, so they're going to have a ton of carryover into the deadlift by doing a wider stance. You know, like I said, it's not like out to the sides of the mono, but a wider stance box squat where they sit back, have a vertical shin angle. Um, they get a lot of power out of their hips, which really helps translate over into that lockout of the deadlift. So would you say their stance is where they can maintain that vertical shin angle? Yeah, yeah for right? sure. Where they can maintain the vertical shin angle from the front and from the side um, is, is ideal. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then with the box squat, how would you describe doing that correctly? Well, that's the, the biggest thing that I look for is that vertical shin angle from mm -hmm. the front and from the side and, um, hinging. So a lot of times people just really struggle with hinging because, you know, the number, the biggest cue in squatting, no matter what kind of squat is chest up. So people think like chest up. So what I find is that people 
they try to say so upright in a box squat that you're, that you, you know, where you're trying to actually achieve that vertical shin angle. So they say so upright then they're, and they're trying to get that vertical shin angle and sit back. So they end up plopping. So they hit the box really hard and really plop to the box instead of being able to sit soft. So trying to tell someone how to hinge and like keep your chest forward, but don't bend over, you know, keep the bar right where it's at. So when people stand up with a bar and they're in that in, in their right position, feet, you know, slightly angled out They're They're fully stacked. The first movement is hips keep maintain that vertical shin angle, but your wherever you pick up the bar up is where it should stay basically. So that's going to mean like hinging, driving your hips back. And I would, and like I said, I, I don't ever want to give the cue to someone to bend over, but sometimes I'm like bend over, like, you mm-hmm. know, like, cause they just trying to stay so upright that the bar end up move, ends up moving really far back. So the bar should stay right where it's at as you hinge back, but start to open, like your hips have to open. You have to drive the floor apart without rolling out on the sides of your feet, but keeping the pressure in the feet to drive it apart so that you can sit back, stay like hinge back, keep your chest right where it's at and be able to hit the box soft. So I always tell people land soft on the box. You don't, you know, don't want to like, you Mm -hmm. know, jam your spine down onto the box, you know, so land soft onto the box, let the hamstrings sit and relax into the box without rolling your pelvis and losing your abs. So your abs have to stay braced, but allowing your hip, your hamstrings to actually sit and relax into the box so that you leg curl and explosively leg curl off of the box. You know, so even coming off of the box too, it's, it's, it's repeating the pattern, the whole, the way up. So you might've done like a perfect descent, the eccentrics perfect. Like you're sitting back, but then you come off the box and you know, your quads fire, you shoot your quads, your knees shoot forward and you kind of like scoop it up, you know, so you have to kind of repeat the same exact pattern on the way up as well. The cueing becomes a weird thing because as you were talking about a lot of people at the, at the start, will actually be their hips will be anteriorly tilted yep you know because they're trying to get this chest Chest up thing then the hips come all forward and then nowadays we feel bad if we tell them to arch because we don't want them to be a banana but you may have to tell them to arch to get into neutral Mm -hmm. which is where they should be yeah your your hips should break first not your knees like you know which they're so used to like maybe if they're a narrow stance squatter it's like break at the knees first or whatever their their cue is for their normal squat you know but it's like on the on this wider stance box while your hips break first you know then your knees then your knees after that so it's kind of like what? But yeah, you're right. Like, you know, not necessarily if you say arch, then they open up that brace and their ribs come up yeah. and, you know, then they're overextended, you know, where it's like, we just want to get into like the neutral, neutral yeah. position where they can stay braced. It's, it's, it's easier to actually work with them, yeah. you know, personally, yeah. <laughs> right. because then the cues can be personalized to that. Mm-hmm. But for a lot of people, I have to tell them like, these are yours. Yeah. Like, don't go so, tell somebody else to do this right, right. because they're not starting in this jacked up position yeah. that you're starting in. The tricky thing is trying to explain to people what to do on the box. Yeah. Right. Cause you'll have those people that just sit down like we are now, yeah. like totally relaxed just and totally collapsed. Relaxed, yeah. <laughs> and you're trying to explain, well, you still need to stay tight, but not all tight, but also relax your hamstrings. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying. Or they sit there statically. Yeah. Like, yes. Like or a touch and nothing. go. Or yeah. yeah. That's usually a mistake people make. Is like they're like, is a touch and go. Or yeah, like you said, they just like sit and completely relax. And then once you relax like that, and you like lose the pressure in your feet, you have, kind of have no choice but to like rock back and rock forward mm-hmm. to get momentum. So that's a big thing people do is a rock for rock back and forward. But there should be very very little like rock back and forward once you're sitting. Like it should stay in that hinge position. You know, all that should really like happen is that your your hamstrings just like sit and like you know semi relax into the box that you fire. And like I said, reverse that movement pattern to come up. I'll have them also, you know, because everybody films everything now, mm-hmm. you know, film from the side and watch the bar path on the way up. Yeah. You know, it yeah, should exactly. be. It should stay in this tight window. I would say like the six inch window right here, like from the time you pick it up, come down and back mm-hmm. up and stay right here. It shouldn't like go this way or that way. It should stay right there. Yes. And that, that, that will help teach them how to come off of the box because if they see this, yeah. you know, it's, I guess you could do that, but you're going to fall over totally <laughs> but you could but if they try to come up like they're using a smith machine you know so tr- in that straight line it's it's fun when they finally get it yeah because they're like oh my god because yeah. <laughs> it's so much easier right you know and bar path shortens and all that right, as well right. with as you lead into a meet how will those waves change well typically uh f- until about four weeks out, the the waves all stay 
the same, you know, not the same, but you know what I mean? We're, yeah. we're varying those three week waves and then, um, three, you know, 21 days out from a competition. Then that day, typically that, th that three weeks out from a meet that week of leading up to, cause typically dynamic effort lowers on a Friday because mm -hmm. we follow the, the classic, um, schedule. Um, we kind of deload that week. Um, leading up to Friday to, into the, the dynamic effort lower week. And then we, that turns into, that's where it gets really confusing pe for people. Cause it's like, okay, if we're trying to peak for something that day, that dynamic effort day turns into circa max, which is more of like max effort. That's when we're going to do the heaviest squat. We're going to overload the squat. And, um, that's going to be like your heaviest day before you start to taper down. So how many I weeks out will that start? Three weeks. So okay. that day, that, that dynamic effort day, the circa max week one is, is three weeks out. So, I mean, technically three weeks in a day. Um, yeah. because it's happening on a Friday, yeah. but yeah, three weeks out that gives your body, your central nervous system time to, you know, you're just really overloading it. And then it, you're starting to taper down from there. So leading up to that, you know, that week though, all the three week waves stay in pattern. And then that, that week of Circamax, like you deload leading up to it. And then on Friday you do your heaviest squat. So Circamax has changed a lot over the years, you know, back in the day, I know you, you guys probably did suit horrible. bottoms, yeah, yeah. Ton, I mean, mm -hmm. every band on the monolift on the machine it was onto the bar, like four or five weeks too. Yeah. You know, so wow. it was longer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there was like an acclimate, you had a week yeah. to get acclimated. Yeah. And then there was like two, actually started at three yeah. really hard weeks. Then obviously like more, we're all getting beat more up. Or strength speed, yeah, yeah, you know, and then yeah. start to taper down. But, you know, for, I think nowadays it's just, we keep the, the waves the same and then you have a, a week of overload. So some people, depending on the person, like it'll be, it could be a ton of chain weight, like, but full gear. So I, you know, had done many different variations of Circamax. And what I found, you know, for me was like, I could do, I was good at box squatting. So, <clears throat> so if I did a suit bottom box squat with like tons of band tension on there, I mean, I could really, I could, I could outrun those bands. Like I, mm -hmm. I could, I was really, I was good at the technique. So it was like, Oh, I just did, you know, 900 and some pounds at the top. You know, I'm, I'm definitely going to squat 800 and then I wouldn't, you know, and yeah. it was just like, okay, what, okay. So you just start to think like, okay, what, what, what would work better for me? And for me, it was full gear squat, um, with no box, you know, knees wrapped, really practice the squat now. So a lot of times I would do that with heavy chains. So I'm still doing the overload, but I'm doing it, um, in the technique of what I'm going to do at the mm -hmm. meet, you know? So instead of something that, uh, is, is just something that I'm good at or whatever. So your you max now is just two weeks. No, it's still the three. It's, yeah, it's still twenty one days out. Yeah, but it's you know, like I said, I'm, like I had changed it for myself back in the day to that three weeks out being l not the box squat. Yeah, it yeah. was like a full gear squat of some kind, um, overloading you know chains, bands, something like that. But a lot of times it was just it was chains. And now a lot of the lifters I have do. I just I'm trying to keep it more like okay. I want you to max out because obviously we don't max in conjugate training. We mm -hmm. rarely ever in training just take a one rep max. You know, sometimes I see people in like doing like raw lifters doing all these different programs. They're just like hitting heavy singles all the time. I'm like, I, I, there's no way, you know, I would have mm -hmm. wanted to do that. You know, I just, I, I enjoyed the process of getting stronger and then saving that day for the meet, you know? So nowadays for Serga Max, I have people do reverse, reverse, uh, micro mini bands. So I'm throwing a, a pair, you know, doubled, you know, but still hung low enough that they're, it's full deload of the bands at the top. So they're, they're getting that full weight, but really they're just getting about 20 to 25 pounds mm -hmm. of overload. You know, they're typically working up to a, a max that's maybe 20 pounds over what their projected max would be for the meat, but they're handling weight that feels pretty real, you know? So I think I've had a lot of good success with lifters doing that. You know, some, and that's not to say that some lifters I might have still do like heavy chains for circa max at circa max week one, but, um, I've been doing a lot more of the reverse, uh, micro band so that people mm -hmm. can, can kind of feel that real weight, but then there's bands on there. So, it, you know, it just kind of allows them to push it a little bit further. It's what we were doing originally. And I think this is, there, there's more to what created the the problem than just the Circamax because yeah. it started, it would have had it because there's, you know, you're not training the week of the meet, then there's the deload basically two weeks. So right. you're looking at like almost seven weeks out. You had to be kind of like meat ready yeah. for Circamax, yeah, yeah. 
right? So now you're looking at all kinds of other issues, right? You know, PEDs and all the other stuff that are now being maximized. Yeah, <laughs> just two to be months. The training. Yeah, yeah, two months before where it really needs to be just to get through the training, right. which became very hit and miss. Yeah. Where over the years, as that's become more condensed and a little closer, you don't run into those issues. Yeah, and it's not as it's not over a hundred percent. A little, right? Is it how much is the top over a projected meat max? Yeah, I mean, like when we're doing the reverse micros, I mean, whatever twenty to twenty five, you know, pounds yeah. is for that so person, it might be like five percent. You yeah. know, it's really, it's more of them just getting the confidence of, yeah. of being like, oh, I just squatted that waist. I know it was with reverse micros, but I'm very confident that with a taper, because right now, like at three weeks, wow, you, you should probably be feeling the shittiest. Like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have this accumulation of training that's just been super hard. You know, I, usually for a meat prep, I'll have people do like 10 weeks. So you've had like seven weeks of, it's been pretty brutal, a lot of full gear lifts. And now it's like, okay, I squatted this this weight, I had this weight on my back 21 days out. Now I get to taper down and I should be feeling even better on meat day. And it just gives people a lot of confidence. Yeah. Well, I think that's one of the areas where people screw up with the Circa Max and probably other training as well is the top weight for some of these things is 300 pounds yeah, over exactly what they're going to hit the okay. meat. Just the systemic fatigue on that right. just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And that's kind of where, that's kind of where I, I came to where I was just like, should I you know, be overloading that much, you know, mm -hmm. and just like doing something that's more, gives people more confidence of like, I just basically squatted this real weight, you know, um, with a little bit of band on there, you know, mm -hmm. it's something about that little band just like, you know, gives them confidence to do it, but also the confidence to know that with a good taper leading into a meet that they'll, they'll hit it on meet day. Now with a dynamic day, with the different bars that you're using, are you strategically laying them out? based upon what the total workload would be. For example, somebody may be stronger with um, a camber bar than a safety squat bar. So if they went safety squat bar, camber bar, straight bar, then sets and reps all being equal, the total volume or the total workload would increase just because they can lift more on the bar. Or are you just putting it in there based upon what, how they can recover from each bar? Uh, well, typically like when I have someone test their one rep max mm -hmm. box squat, I typically have them do it with a safety squat bar. Cause for a lot of people, that one's the hardest. Mm -hmm. Um, people love the giant camber bar, something about having your hands down here and just like being able to like, although some people hate it, um, I'd say for the most part, people love the giant camber bar and the safety squat bar, not so much. So, um, you know, how people do the safety squat bar to test their max. And then when it comes to meat prep, we try to stick it, keep it to just the giant camber bar or the safety squat bar, you know, just, I, I have no reason to have someone to have their hands up on, yeah. on a bar to put stress on their elbows and shoulders for no reason. So we'll keep it to those two bars. And then, like you said, if there's someone that's just like particularly bad at, at a sp certain bar, then maybe it might be like, okay, the last three week wave, we're not doing that yeah. one, you know, it's mm -hmm. kind of like basing it off that certain individual. All right. The reason that I ask is I think Louie had an article years ago you know, figuring all the Louis yeah. being Louis, right? You know, figuring all this, this out. Percentage, yeah. yeah. And it's one of those that when it comes out, it creates kind of like hell for all of us because we got to explain, yeah. you know, yeah. what all this <laughs> is. And but the the readers of that will think that's the gold key. Yeah. Right, and it's right. like, well, first off, your maxes may not be the same. Yeah. You know, as what how that's laid out. Yeah. So it could actually be backwards. Right. You and know, I think with someone that? who's pretty seasoned in the conjugate system and using this, the different bars are pretty good at all of the bars. Like it's, there's not going to be one that's, you know, you have a super glaring weakness with, I think, you know, it's been my experience with, with lifters that, you know, as long as they've been doing it for a while, they're, they're good at all the bars. There's mm -hmm. not one that is just like, they're really terrible at. Now the speed pulls, do they fall after the dynamic squat? Yeah. Yeah. And like for a long time, um, you know, I mean, my whole training career, I mean, I only did you know, like maybe 10 singles and against bands. I didn't really add a lot of variety to that. Um, but, and there was no like waving of it, but I have more so lately had people do it like in conjunction with the, the speed squat. So like week one, you know, that's when we'll do like, you know, lightweight, um, you know, we'll kind of maybe even do the same rep scheme. Um, but then, you know, then there's some people like some of my guys my bigger guys that I coach, which I don't have a ton of like you know, equipped lifters, but like I, they have expressed that it's hard for them to do two reps, three reps, you know, on, on speed pulls, they, they do better when they can do fast singles that, you know, they'll still like, I'll, I'll do 20 reps, you know, I just don't want to do, you know, 
eight yeah. sets of three or 10 sets of two, you know, so they'll do. So if, if that's the case, I'll say do one single every 20 seconds, mm-hmm. you know, until you get 20 singles in something like that, but, you know, to get the, the volume in, but not, you know, necessarily like they're just struggling to, to maintain the speed by beyond a single rep. Mm-hmm. So outside of with the raw lifters, as they're going into a meet, does the max effort day have their raw squat in it more frequently as the meet comes around? Yeah. Like that, that, um, so actually leading up to, for a lot of my raw lifters, you know, I'll use Alex Donald as an example, cause she's a raw lifter that we have at the gym and she's, you know, kind of, she switched when I started coaching her a few years ago, she switched from a, just a very classic periodization programs, SBD days, things like that, you know? And so I was, she was probably actually one of my first actually probably one of my first raw lifters that like wanted to do conjugate. So many people were like, no, no, no. Um, and she was like, I'll, I'll give it a go. And so I was actually really, I was like, okay, you know, th- this is my experiment right mm-hmm. here. And she's, and, you know, she's pulled 573 now raw and, um, you know, she's got a 500 and like 525 squat, you know, and it's all, and it's, she, her numbers have gone up exponentially, you know, cause she's, she's also very trusting. She's bought in, like, you know, you have to believe in what mm-hmm. you're doing and she fully does. She does all the work. She believes in it. She believes in me as her coach. And, um, you know, so for her, someone like her in, in the off season leading up to the meat prep, um, and actually leading up into like about eight weeks out from a meet. Um, yeah, the, Mondays are very squat there. It's, it's squat volume or max effort variations, but it's, you know, some squat volume again, like, you know, it might be, we might be way out from a meet and she's doing like in the 60 to 70% range. But as we get closer to like starting meat prep, then now we're in the 70, 80, 85% range, you know, for reps, depending on what the percentage is, um, with some, some with it, like maybe every third week being a max effort variation so that she can, you know, again, learn how to strain under those weights. Um, and you know, some, some deloading in here and there from doing max effort or like heavy volume, depending on where she's at. But, um, then after about, cause she'll do like a heavy double, like on week two of meat prep. Um, and then after that, it's all variation. She's doing squatting reverse band squat. She's doing, um, you know, squat opener. She's doing the reverse micro mini band squat for circa max. You know, so it's, it's very conjugate meat prep you know, for, um, most of, for all my lifter, all my raw lifters, they're mm-hmm. on, on max effort lower day, we're either doing a squat or a deadlift. So they're doing a max effort squat on Monday, which is, you know, a meet, week one of meat prep is we typically always start off with a pool against bands, you know, so they've done all their volume for the most part, except for like some of the, the except for the raw lifters on, on dynamic effort days after doing the box squats, I will have them do some volume and staying in a lower range and that, you know, 70 to 80% range, um, kind of alternating between volume and, and traditional speed work, you know, so they're still getting in some volume in for their speed pulls. They're not doing down sets on, on, um, max effort day. Um, but you know, the, basically their down sets are happening as their yeah. speed pulls basically mm-hmm. on dynamic effort day. It sounds super confusing, but, um, well, it, no, it makes sense yeah, though, because you're trying to get, yeah, you're trying. All right, guys, this is how I use my element packs. I got a few different ways that I'll use it. So currently just got done training. So post training, I will mix one of the chocolate, this is the chocolate caramel, and my oatmeal. I'm more of a half packet guy. So put about a half a packet in there, and then stir it around. Then it adds that salty chocolate taste to it. If for some reason I'm using chocolate protein in my oatmeal, then I won't put that in there. I'll put a half pack in my coffee, which I'm not going to do now, but the chocolate mocha is really good in the coffee. And then for training, <clears throat> when I trained earlier today, it's simply my favorite is the grapefruit salt. Pretty much just a you know a half pack in there, and then kind of reseal the packs and then put them in and then so for training you know i'll have a half a pack and then half a pack in the oatmeal so it's about a pack a day if i'm sweating really bad 
during training, then I might use a full pack in there. But the go-to for me is the oatmeal because it's an everyday thing. Dave Tate's a very strong individual. I did not work out, but I did scope out the equipment scene there, of course, because I'm a huge purchaser of Elite. Matt Goodwin, the equipment rep, the main equipment rep there, I've known for years, helped us out tremendously. He's part of my dream team, and the bigger you get, the more equipment you're going to need. You got, so whether it's a high school, personal training facility, a garage gym, we've got years and years of experience on building these things out and laying them out and designing them and making sure you're buying the things that you need and not necessarily the things that you will never use. He's my guy. And the bigger you get, the more equipment you're going to need, obviously, to outfit these facilities and the more they need to be upkept, the more they need to be replaced. And it actually becomes a problem for us. That doesn't really happen um, without guys like Matt. So myself, Nate Harvey, Chris Bartle, we've got years of experience. Chris and Nate have both been strength coaches, um, business owners. We can help you guys in any aspect of your gym build. So never hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, there's a contact us page on the website. All of our information's on there. You can reach me directly at mgoodwin at elitefts.net. The phone number here is 888-854-8806, and we can answer any questions you guys have. I'm, t I'm talking to him more and more, especially as we continue to grow and expand, and it's something to consider. So I'm really pumped to have the story come full circle for sure. So feel free to reach out to us at any time. We're always here to help, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Why should anyone join this Discord? Why wouldn't you want to? It's not fake. It's genuine. It's authentic. It's well worth it. The Discord has been nothing short of meeting new people who are incredibly like-minded, giving each other a bunch of ball busting, but also being there to support each other in whatever life throws their way. The best part of it for me has also been able to connect with lifters of all levels, help coach, get coached, and also connect with other new fathers who are enjoying the journey of lifting and trying to balance that out. It's the glue that holds all of us together. A common interest will bring people from different walks of life people who are multi-millionaires, these characters and everything else in between, united under one thing, the pursuit of strength. I think most of us would agree that getting a coach is a great step forward that an athlete can make to make greater progress. But what if you had two coaches? What if you had a whole bunch of coaches and a whole bunch of driven elite level athletes and like-minded people all in your corner trying to make you better? That's exactly what you're going to get with the Table Talk Discord crew to manage the fatigue yeah right so if there's <clears throat> you have to choose mm -hmm. you know do you want to have two high stimulus days right. like that when there's already the bench there yeah or are you going to try to put it all you know on one to allow for more recovery right. so yeah. it makes sense yeah so i try to do a lot of like any like volume type of work in the off season that way and when we get into me prep it's it's very um one rep max variations getting them ready to learn how to like to, to strain, you know, getting ready to, to max out and then on meet day. But, um, the accessory work is what is, you know, have to dial in and make sure that like they're building their, you know, even though they're not doing a lot of reps of squat or, um, or things like that, they're still doing heavy accessory work to maintain that strength and, and, and build that strength mm -hmm. during, during meat prep. So how do you determine what their, their accessory work is going to be? This it's a, it's a double edged question because you have the people you work with in person, yeah. which you can regulate that. Then you have the ones that you don't. So let's go with the ones that you don't. Yeah. And then how do you bucket those accessories? Then how do you go about changing those? Well, I mean, I have to, like, I have some people that, you know, I just do programming for, so there's not a lot of like yeah. interaction. So for them, it's just keeping the, like I said before, like keeping the accessories well-rounded. So even if it's an upper body day, we're doing two accessories that are, um, back like lats, rows, um, and then two accessories that are triceps, you know, things, there's a lot of extensions, um, you know, lockout work, things like that. So keeping it well-rounded for each of those days, you know, we're changing it every week, but it's, it's making sure that we don't miss anything. And it's not just a full day of like, like I said, hamstrings, but where's the glutes or spinal erectors, where's the reverse hypers, you know, it's, it's very well-rounded. So they're following, following that. And then if, if someone's, I have a lot of people that I work with, like with like coaching and I just have to like, figure out how they're doing that week. I've had a lot of people like during this meet prep, because of course the seasons are changing and people are sick and it's like, you know, I mean, cause if you don't like some people will be like, I have the flu, but I still went in and did it. It's like, no, you know, um, 
do not like go in and train with the flu. Like you, there, you are not going to make anything, but you're not going to get stronger. You're going to make it worse. You're going to not recover as quickly from the flu. I'd rather you just focus on recovering from the flu, mm -hmm. you know, so being able to, to regulate with them or as far as accessories go for them, you know, if, if, um, I had one girl during this meet prep who was just really struggling, you know, with, um, motivation and, and things like that. And so I was like, okay, let's, let's cut it down to a three day a week program. You know, so we're only going to train three days and I had to like, okay, like how am I going to do this meat prep on uh, with three days a week? And, you know, sure enough, she came back up and was like, okay, I'm feeling much better. You know, so it's really hard. Cause it's like, for some people can just follow, you know, just follow this program and like, and make, make gains. But it's like, you know, sometimes there's things you got to change mm -hmm. whether, it, whether it's with accessory work or the load of the accessory work or just the entire training week in general. So when you're looking at the accessory work and you're putting that out there, um, mm -hmm. how many reps in reserve will each one of those accessories have? And is that laid out? Uh, well, usually the first movement will be something that's heavy. It's usually in the eight rep range and that's like zero reps in reserve. That's, yeah. that's like going as heavy as you can. Like, you know, I pick one thing. And so if someone, if I know someone has a specific weakness, it's like, okay, I'm going to put that first. I want that to be the thing that you put the most effort and intensity into. So if someone is really, um, struggling to pull weight off the ground and that's something that's important to them, then it's like, okay, we're going to do good mornings you know, as the first, et cetera. So not only as like, and especially in me prep, we're not doing any good mornings as max effort anymore. We've, we've kind of thrown that out. So we might need to put that in more often as an accessory, or maybe the first accessory where it's six to eight reps and it's zero reps and, you know, we're doing three to four sets as heavy as you can. Um, and then the, the other like three to four, you know, typically like th two, maybe three accessory movements are okay. Now we're in the 10 to 12 rep range. And then the third accessory might be reverse hypers. And we're in the three sets of 20 rep range, mm -hmm. you know, so it starts to taper down, you know, but that first, that first accessory should be something that is your weakness, you know, but again, like I said, if, if pulling weight off the ground and spinal rectors and abs are your weakness that you don't want to just like, like the entire workout yeah. is only things for your spinal rectors, because while you, while you work, while you focus on one thing, another thing is getting weak. <clears throat> How frequent will you, will those accessories change, assuming that you're not having to stick something in there because of a weak point that you saw? Uh, if it's something that they really need to, if it's something like a weak point that I saw, then we'll do that three weeks in a row, you know, um, cause you got to change it after three yeah. weeks, you got to change it, you know? So, you know, we might kick it out for a few weeks and then bring it back in. But, um, the most I would do is three weeks in a row, but for, for most people that don't have something that's like a very glaring weakness, we're changing the work, the accessories, every single workout, every single week. Okay. Unless someone's newer. Like if I have a newer lifter, um, then I like I might do all the, you know, their max effort lower workout. Those accessories might stay the same for three weeks in a row and then we change the entire accessory workout. And what would the rest periods be of those? Um, so if it's that first main, that main accessory, that's a weakness and it's like heavy zero reps and reserve type of accessory movement, then that would be like two to four minute rest periods. But, um, for most, most everything else, I'm like, that's another way you can build, you know, build conditioning is through keeping your rest period shorter. If it's something in the 12 to 20 uh, rep range, then your rest period should be like a minute. You know, and even if you think you're doing a minute, I bet you it's probably like five. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Again, yeah. if you filmed right, yourself, right. you know, what would you actually see? Yeah. I'll look at weak points or weaknesses in a lift as either being physical, mental, or technical. So we'll assume that it's not technical and it's not mental, yeah. but it's physical. And then you mentioned if they're weak off the floor and it's a deadlift, what would be your go-to for that? Or what would be your go-to's, plural, you know, for if somebody is weak off the floor with a deadlift? Uh well, good mornings, mm -hmm. seated good mornings or standing good mornings, like heavy in the, you know, if it's the main movement, the three rep range or the, um, six to eight rep range and, you know, different variations of those, like actually in a good morning, like making, if, if you're weak off the ground, I would mimic my deadlift technique, you know? So if I'm a conventional, well, I mean, typically, I mean, you can vary your stance as well, but typically like in a conventional stance and keeping that same like kind of movement pattern. So a lot of times people wind up squatting the way well, that's a mistake people make too with the mm -hmm. mornings is it ends up looking like a squat, you know, cause they want to, they want to move more weight. So they say, I want to keep adding weight. I want to keep adding weight. And the next thing you know, they're like shooting their butt under and picking it up like a squat. Um, so heavy, good mornings. And then, like I said, the heavy ab work, those are the two things, you know, to, to really move weight off the ground. That's not to say though, that like you have to have strong lats and upper back to pull weight off the ground. Like if you're, if your lats are weak, you know, that's, what's going to kind of give up on, on that. You kind of give those up 
first as well on that, on that initial pull. So people will start to like kick the ro- the bar starts to roll out or get away from them if their lats aren't strong, or if they don't have that mind muscle connection to know that like, even though you're, you know, you're trying to move, weight up, you think like legs, you think back, you know, to move the weight off the ground. But like, if you're not, if your lats aren't loaded and you're not pulling the slack out, you know, that bar is just going to roll out in front of you. And it doesn't matter how mm-hmm. strong your, your core is. Yeah. You make a good point there that it, it's, it's not, it's not where you are weak. It's what happens yeah. when you're weak. Cause right. you can be missing off the floor for multiple different reasons. Yeah. And sumo, it's so technical that I think people lose patience, you know, because it takes with sumo, it's, it could, it could look, I don't know if you remember Alexander Kucher, like how mm-hmm. long it looked like it was going to, there's like, no way he's not making this lift. And he's just pulling and pulling and pulling. And that bar's bending more and more and more. Cause he was 165 pounds pulling 793, I think. And it just looked like, it looked like it was 10 seconds of him just like pulling. And you just think there's no way this weight's coming off the ground. And then once it broke like a quarter of an inch, then it was fine. You know, people don't have that kind of patience in sumo to maintain position and not like start to like, you know, round over, you do kind of contort their body to try to get Mm -hmm. it to move off the ground, you know, just maintaining that position and having the strength to stay, to under load like that, maintain the position and trust and know that like, if I just wait, cause that just got to wait for that slack to pull. And then once that, uh, that slacks out, then once some weight moves off the ground, it's fine. It's the weirdest thing with sumo where conventional is kind of the opposite. Then it's more explosive. It's more of that, like, you know, good technique, good, um, you know, good, that good technique, grip and rip type of thing, Mm -hmm. you know, off of with conventional. The sumo is almost like two or three lifts, depending upon the, or it's three sections of the lift, depending upon the bar. Right. You know, because a lot of that that you're talking about with Kucher was, while that's going on, he's also getting himself in better position, you know, wedging knees out, you know, pulling slack out. Right. And then with like a kabuki bar there's there's a whip at the top so much more yeah <laughs> you know so now you got to like pull slow pull fast then pull slow, slow again right right you know to, just to be able to control that yeah you can't like do that explosively yeah. at all with that bar now if they're say just below the knee but maintaining position what would be the go-to there so if, if they've got it off the ground yeah so that a lot of times can be like hamstring like um so doing um Obvi- you know, obviously if we're doing lockout, it'd be more like your hips that, that are weak. But if you're like kind of at that knee level, that's like a lot of hamstrings. So inverse curls, glute ham raises, things that really isolate your hamstrings to be able to like, if you're, let's say, we'll say if you're conventional though, like with conventional, that's the one lift uh, sumo. I'm like, okay, it should look like your box squat, vertical shin angle from the front and from the side. So that's a lot of hamstring if you're stuck, you know, right at that knee level, but for conventional, then I'm like, okay, now your knees can be over the bar. Um, for a lot of people, leverage wise, and these can be over the bar so that your, your center mass is like straight over the bar so that when you're pulling, it's more of like a leg press off the ground. Mm-hmm. But as you come up, like your knees pull back, everything comes through. So it's like, depending on which lift it is, so if it's like conventional and they're stuck, like at the knees, like it's like, could it be leg press? So they have weak quads, um, or hamstring, you know, I would definitely work both, mm-hmm. you know, but if someone's really struggling at the lockout, then it's like, okay, box squats you know, box squats, even if someone's like, I don't believe in speed work, whatever. I don't believe in the conjugate method, at least add, add box squats in as maybe an accessory, you know, cause it's, it's very good for building your hips for the, for a lockout. Mm-hmm. So if we move on to the bench, you know, all contact still the same, it's not mental, it's not technical yeah. and they're <laughs> weak off the chest is a tricky one, right? Um, they lowered fine. Right. So there's control, there's tension as they lowered. And then the power off the chest isn't there. That could be a number of things. It could be leg drive. Maybe you do not know how to use your legs for leg drive. Um, or it could, a lot of times it's, it's your upper back. Like you don't know how to engage your upper back to drive off your chest. It's not, not typically for the most part, for most people, it's not typically weak chest or anything like Mm -hmm. that or weak shoulders. It's, um, either a weak upper back or not knowing, not having that mind muscle connection to be able to, to engage their lats to press off their chest. So it's, it's, it's like this this whole series of events that happen to, to push weight off your chest, like leg drive. That's why I tell people your legs should be driving from the second you take the weight out of the rack. Like it shouldn't, it's not like 
Um, it's not like you should touch and then all of a sudden have leg drive. You should be standing up on your legs from the second you take the weight out. So they're already engaged. There's no like, like limp legs and then they drive explosively. They should already be engaged from the second you time, take the weight out of the hooks and, you know, and you start to lower, that's when you really squeeze your glutes, stern them up to the bar. So, I mean, it could be something like that. Like they're coming down with good control, but are they really, you know, loading their lats as, as they bring it down? Like, so loading their back so that when they touch your lats are ready to fire again. Again, you know, your, your glutes should already be pushing, but they do drive again. I think that's part of why people raise their butt off the bench is that their legs are limp. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden they have this mm -hmm. explosive leg drive. And, you know, so then you throw, they kind of like thrust their hips off the bench where it's like, if you just kind of, kind of stand up on your legs from the second you take the weight out. And I think of the, um, the bench press kind of as a box squat as well, wide, you know, keep your feet away from the bench, wide stance and push the floor apart. Like, so it's, you're, you're driving all that energy comes through your posterior chain and not just like um, legs kind of tight touching the, uh, the bench. And then you get this leg drive through your quad, through your hip flexors. And then all of a sudden they, the butt comes off the bench. So it's like spread your feet out a little bit, um, drive your heels out and down towards the ground. And then, um, you know, that way your glutes are engaged. Your glutes are engaged will help bring your sternum up and you're kind of leaning back into the bench, turning it into sort of like a pseudo de decline type of bench, you know, mm -hmm. but I mean, there's, so there's so many, so many things, leg drive, you leg drive, either weakness in their upper back or just not knowing how to use their upper back. Uh, with uh, pretty much every lift there's, <clears throat> have you seen <laughs> like seasons of things that people screw up? Like right now in the bench, what I see for the last 18 months, it's like keeping the ribs up, you know, keeping yeah. the sternum up. It's like the season of the sternum uh, dropping, right? right? right, right. <laughs> Whereas, you know, years ago, it might be the season of not being able to keep pressure on your feet. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's a weird thing, you yeah. know, in, in the squat. focus on one thing and it's like, it's this, everything should be where it's a full body lift at all, yeah. every time. Yes. Yeah. Your whole body should yes. be like just fatigued by the time you get done. Now, if they, if they miss midpoint and the elbows, don't turn. Right. So there, where would you go there? I mean, that might not be necessarily a specific muscle group that's this week. You know, I'd try to do a lot of def dead presses and different ranges of motion so that you, it might just be like, like we talked about before, it's thinking your way through the lift. It's like, when I'm here, like, what do I do? Okay. I need to twist, like take the bar and twist it. Like I'm trying to break it this way. You know, I'm not literally going to mm -hmm. do this with my elbows, but here it's like, okay, my, I'm still driving with my lats. I'm like, you know, Dave, you know, Hoff said something that clicked with it. Like when we were both competing, I was just like, oh my gosh, I do that same thing. And I never knew what I was doing. But when he said it, I was like, that's what I do. And it was like, yeah, when I get stuck there, I'm not thinking about pushing the bar anymore. As long as my elbows are in a good spot. And like I said, I'm not like, you know, doing anything crazy flared out or anything. Um, as long as I'm here and my knuckles are stacked. So sometimes people are stuck here too. The wrists are really far bent back and you never want the bar like over, you want everything stacked, all your joints stacked. So as long as I'm in this good position and I'm driving my legs down and everything and I'm starting to stall or I'm stalled, it's like, okay, I'm not gonna really press this bar anymore. I'm going to move my body away. I'm going to actually get under it. Like I'm going to almost like trick the bar, you know, mm -hmm. do some sort of magic trick here. I'm not even going to like press this bar up anymore. I'm actually going to like get under it. You, know, you twist my elbows to, you know, to try to break the bar and engage my triceps. But I'm actually going to try to lower my body, like push it down through the bench to actually, and I think what that does is just helps you to, to get that, mm -hmm. that cue to be able to like turn my elbows by breaking the bar this way to engage my triceps, um, to get like down further underneath the bar. Then the lockout. <laughs> Lockout is just like all triceps. So, you know, you've got classic tricep exercises, you know, neutral grip, dumbbell presses, but, uh, you know, and, um, you know, classic skull crushers, but a lot of extensions. So tape presses, rollback mm -hmm. extensions, um, JM presses, things like that, that work the lower part of your triceps. So, you know, there's a lot of things, you know, we're working the, trying to get leverage by building, you know, muscle up higher, but we're actually trying to build thickness around the elbow. Cause you know, if you are stuck in that spot, like I want the muscle like to this closest to my elbow to extend. So it's just building that lower part by doing different extensions. And, um, but then, you know, that's going to build that muscle there, but actually handling heavy weights. So doing like, um, dead presses, like different pin presses. So up high, like doing like overloading against band tension or straight weight for, 
you know, six, 10, six to 10 reps, um, is what I, I found helped a ton. Like, you know, granted back in the day we did crazy. One of my favorite exercises when Louis had the big foam blocks, you know, we would like sink and throw, I'm just like, yeah, we stopped doing that because that was a little mm -hmm. dangerous, but like, you know, we experimented with a lot of different things, but that's all the, the lockouts, all triceps, like learning how to handle heavyweight, you know, um, so doing different ranges of motion, board, high board, board presses or pin presses, but then doing those extensions for the, the muscle above the elbows. With the, with the dead press or pin press, where, where do you tell your lifters to start from? Because that can be a tricky one. Yeah. Because they may start at their neck, they may start at their sternum, they may start all over the place. Yeah, like yeah, the bunch of times people will start like way too high. You know, you got to start like you know, depending on what the um, what range of motion you're using. So if they're, if we're starting like pretty low, yeah. like in that like couple inches above the chest, then it should start like you know right at like basically like around your sternum, and your elbows need to stay like stacked under the bar. Like you're not going to move heavy weight off of those pins if you're not truly like, like back engaged, back pressing into the um, bench. And almost like, you know, we talked about pulling slack out of the bar for deadlift. You should be pu pushing slack out of the bar for bench too. So like, I'm not, I'm not trying to push this bar off the pins yet, but I'm, I'm put loading it. You know, I've got, I feel, I feel my back, my Every, every, every muscle in my body is loaded into the bar and now I can press mm -hmm. it on the pin. So I think people make the mistake of like, you know, they're just like kind of loose and then trying to push uh, yeah. it up. It's not going to move, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, I think that's why I love the dead press. Cause if you can really learn that, if you can learn how to load the bar, I think that'll really translate over into a regular bench press. No, oh, I think that's key right yeah. there because it's most don't. Yeah. They just get under and then you try to press. Yeah. From, from like a dead stop. I know it's a dead yes. stop, but like you should still load the bar. And it's, it's the same thing for squat on your, on your squat pickup. I see a lot of people like just like completely loose and then they like jam the bar out of the, out of the hooks. It's like squat bench deadlift are the same. Like it's just people understand the deadlift pulling the slack out. Like most people understand like pulling the slack out, but you should be pushing, like loading the bar for bench, you know, even before you take it out. Like, so I always tell people like, if you're really doing, if you're, if you want to load your lats in the bench press, then it should be very easy for your handoff person to give you a handoff at the heaviest weight. Like I've given, um, guys handoffs with six, 600 pounds and it was fine for me because they know how to take weight out. Like you as the lifter should be loaded so much that it's like, I'm just guiding the weight out to you. Mm -hmm. You know, like I should, you, the handoff person shouldn't feel like they're taking like, you know, 60% of the weight, it's the other way around. Like you should be taking 60, your handoff person should be taking 40, if not, you know, less. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's kind of an important thing too, with taking the weight out, like, and making sure that you're pulling, you know, eyes are underneath the bar. You're not set up like, like back here, like this, you know, um, eyes underneath the bar so that you can actually get into that position where you load your lats. And then it's just super easy to take it out, but then your lats are already loaded. You're not like taking it out with loose hands and then receiving the weight. And then how are you going to get your lats tight then, you know, mm -hmm. when you, when you're just completely loose and then receiving all that weight at once out above your touch point, it's too hard to, once you're in that position to, to get your lats like loaded. So that's kind of like, Totally no, but thing, I would, but. I would say it's, I mean, that will lead into the squat there, but a lot of benches are missed just on that mm -hmm. aspect. Yeah. They don't start right. Right. Where I would say on the squat, and I'm sure that you would agree that most squats are missed because they're not started right. Oh my God. The pickup. And I know this from my own experience that like when I had a really good pickup on it and most of my pickups were good, but if I had a bad one, I know I, I it was I was either going to miss that squat or it was going to be a lot harder. And I don't want to have like a, a squat where I have to like just struggle to get it. Cause that's going to take, take it out of me for bench and deadlift for the rest of the day. You know, if I'm at a meet, um, your pickup truly dictates ever the whole lift. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how would you walk through how to do that? For a squat? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, assuming that someone's using a mono lift, that it makes it a lot easier, yeah. you know. So, um, just being well, having, maybe, yeah, you know, if they know what they're doing, yeah, it can, right, you it know. Helps. But if they don't, you know, then they're screwed. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, having a ritual is important. So, making sure that you're doing the same thing every time. Yeah, um, you know, walking up to the bar, like you know, seeing the bar on your chest, you know, exactly where it, it should be. So then, when you go to a meet, obviously. Um, you know, you'd be giving your rack height, but you should also know when you walk up to the bar, like this is at the right spot on my chest, you know, when I stand up and stand up to it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I always look, would look over the top of the bar and look down at my feet. 
and make sure that I could see, I mean, I would just look, I would keep my head like neutral and look down and, and I'd make sure that I could see the, the front half of my foot. That way I knew that I was not too far forward, not too far backward because, you know, your monolift at home, at your home gym is going to be different than the monolift at the meet. So you never want to like look down at your feet and gauge it off of the sides of the monolift because, you know, one mm-hmm. might be wider than another. So just having the ritual of, you know, you know, walking up to the bar the same every time from the same side or whatever and, you know, knowing where, what it looks like on your chest looking down, making sure your feet, because if your feet are too far forward, you know, you're, no matter how good of a pickup is, you're going to fall back and you definitely don't have your feet too far backwards. Cause it's going to put a ton of pressure on your low back mm-hmm. to try to like basically good morning it out of the hooks. You really want to be over that midfoot. Um, so, you know, one, then, then I'll like get under the bar, get it wedged into my upper back, kind of get my feet rooted into the ground. And then once I feel my feet rooted into the ground and I push my hips under, but not too far, you don't want to be like, like I said, like tucked under too much. Um, once I feel, you know, my hips are slightly back, but my body is fully underneath the bar, then I can actually put dry pressure up into my traps. So I'm putting pressure up, but I want to actually feel the weight. Like, like as I'm putting pressure up, I should feel the weight, like sort of like, it's like just starts to go down my entire body. Once I feel like, like, like my entire body is supporting that bit of pressure up into the bar, then I know I'm ready to, then all I have to do, cause I'm loaded partially, you know, I'm not picking it up yet. All I have to do is just squeeze my legs glutes, mm-hmm. quads, hips, um, to actually pick the weight up, you know, and let it, cause I'm at that point too, I've let it settle. Sometimes people really like they swing their hips under and then pick it up. And it's like, wait, get your hips under, put pressure up, feel the, feel the weight like th- distributed through your whole body. And then, then, you know, the bar's settled, the bar's not moving, the hooks aren't moving. Um, and then you just pick it straight up and it's just a s- smooth, easy pickup and lock your legs completely so that, um, when you're you basically stacked, we talk, you know, talk about being stacked. Um, then there's no rush. You can pick it up, hold it, make sure it's settled. You might have to wait for a squat command. So there, you don't want to, the worst thing in the world is picking it up a weight when you're not like fully locked on your bone structure. And then it just feels like a million pounds. You just have to hurry up and go, you know, like I, you know, I got to go with this weight, you know, if you, with your max weight, it should feel like, okay, like, obviously I don't want to stand here for a minute straight, but like I could, you know, like, Mm -hmm. um, if you have the right pickup. I think the part of that, that you just said that I see people mess up the most is you know when the, when you're underneath it your hips are back right so you're the, here's another thing they mess up is they don't pull their air they wait to pull their air until their hips are completely underneath yeah. them especially yeah. if you're in gear good luck with right, that right and granted you're still going to pull more air but you need to get as much as you can when your hips are back right and then when you shift under and wedging and the knees are out you talked about applying pressure mm-hmm. as you're rooting your feet. Right. While you're doing that, you're also kind of checking if your feet are in the right place or yeah. not. Because as you're trying to push that pressure down there, if you feel you're too much on your toes, it's very easy to kick your hips back out again. Yeah. You know, adjust the feet, come back in, test the pressure. Yep. You're not putting hundreds of pounds of pressure no, when you're doing no, that. Not at all. You're just putting enough pressure in there to see, am I in the right spot? Right. Good. Feet are good. Back's good. Now yeah, you can pull the rest of the up, air right. and then pick up through there. And it's just a couple seconds. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but they'll go, like you said, from back here to tr- boom. Yeah. It's like, what the hell? Right. There's no doubt you're falling forward totally. all the way down because you're on too, your toes. Yeah. too. It's just too risky. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's why it's important to have that ritual so that it's not just like different every time. It's just like, okay, this is what I do. Step, you go through your steps basically. And um, that way it's, it's consistent. All right. Now with going through the squat, if they, if out of the hole, they fall forward. You know, assuming technique and all, so going back to the other contact, so assuming all that's there, which I'll put this out there, you normally isn't, Yeah. right? So it's going back to my mental, physical, and technical, usually the answer is always mental or technical, Right. 90% of the time. Totally. But what we get asked, and the reason I'm asking this is because this is what we're always asked, what exercise do (laughs) I need to do if I'm- It's a loaded question. (laughs) It's very loaded and it's it's very wrong. Yeah. Because normally you're going to look at those other aspects first. Mm -hmm. You know, mental can play into the recovery too. Right. Right. If you're brain fog because you're not sleeping and nutrition, that's a mental issue as well. Um, but all that aside, if they're coming out of the bottom and then falling forward, and they, it is an exercise selection thing, yeah. which if you're working with a good coach, it, it should default to that because yeah. the other things should be taken care of right, right. because of that. Where, where would be the, 
movements. Well, I mean, if they're if they're kind of falling forward into their knees, you know, it could be are their you know, quads stronger than the hamstrings, you know, which I mean, for a narrow stance, raw squatter, yes, like quads should be very, very strong. Um, but maybe their hamstrings are incredibly weak, you know, in their hand, you know, so they're just kicking forward into their quads. So maybe taking some time to really focus on, on just like really, um, isolating the hamstrings and doing hamstring accessory work would be helpful. Now, if they're falling forward into their, um, like into their back, you know, their back is dropping, then that's good mornings again, you know, cause that's the biggest thing I find with, with raw lifters out of the hole is like, you know, they come up and then they like, you know, their hips shoot up and they fall into their back because their upper back and upper back and spinal rectors just aren't strong enough to like drive up out of the hole. You know, their legs could be super strong, but, um, I think that, you know, that'd be something to look at. Are, I mean, are you doing good mornings at all? Or are you pushing them hard? You know, are you doing them frequently enough? Um, I would say like good morning variations, even seated good morning variations. If you're if really doing a good seated good morning, that's a lot of like upper spinal rectors, like, you know, lower traps, um, you know, traps, neck, you know, things like that, that like are actually important for a squat, especially in, in a, for a raw lifter. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with lifters that can't keep the bar on their back for the good mornings seated nor it's more an issue standing i guess than it would yeah. be seated but are they using a specialty bar probably not yeah you know yeah, so it'll like, be rolling well, it's, it's not going to happen with a cambered bar right <laughs> yeah they have yeah. no access to like a specialty bars and they're having to use a um a straight bar then it's like well maybe moving it down a little bit lower um wide wide grip you know and then just they might be going down too low too you don't need for a good morning like a heavy good morning you do not need to go all the way down to parallel you know it's it's it is still above parallel i mean not a lot above parallel mm -hmm. but i would say if it's if they can't keep it on their back then they're probably um keeping their legs too straight and then bending over too much for yourself would you say that that position would be you know, this is coming from a dude that was a fat guy, right? So this is why I'm, I'm asking more out of curiosity. Would the, was that position when you would feel the belt hit the top of your thighs? Yeah. I mean, that would be, yeah. I mean, I guess it depends on, on it someone's yeah, leverages. Yeah, it does yeah. depend upon the leverages, yeah. but kind of across the board that always seemed to be kind of a good gauge. Right. Yeah. Just, Unless just they're slightly falling, above parallel. I mean, if they're falling way forward and they're not hinging back, yeah. then it's never going to do that. Right, right. You know, yeah. so that's part of it as well. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Good morning. Seated good morning, standing good mornings. And just, yeah, keeping it slightly above parallel and just working that position, you know, where, where they're failing at, you know. Um, but also I think a lot of it, you know, is, is glutes and hamstrings and, um, and just accessory works in, in general. Sometimes people are just doing so many, so much volume and squats and no accessory work. I know, I know some people just don't think it's important and like, it's just too, more important to do way more of the, the main lift. But it's like, if you're having issues like that, then it's like, I think a lot of times people just don't do any or you know, if they do, it's just very, it's nothing, it's nothing that's like targeted towards a weakness, you know? Mm -hmm. So I still think that like, for the most part, this person probably just needs accessory work, you know, but, um, working the good mornings and doing, uh, glute ham raises, inverse curl, inverse curl is, um, you know, the, I know there's a machine for that, but like you can do yeah. Nordic curls and, um, band assisted inverse curl. Mm -hmm. And Where? reverse hypers, a lot of, you know, a lot of, rever a lot of volume in reverse hypers. I'm speculating here, but I think a lot of what you were talking about, where it comes from is, you know, just doing the main lifts and saying that's yeah. all you really need to do. A lot of that, you know, has been more popular over the past decade, I assume. Yeah. And that's how most people come in. So that they come into the uh, sport that way, then in a mind warp type of way, that's the default to what you think actually kind of works. But right. And that may have worked very well for them because it's helping them to learn the technique, practice, per se. Yeah. You know, yeah. of those lifts, and it will get them, you know, to a certain point, but then it's going to fall back onto yeah. e either what muscle group is weak or what part of the lift is being compromised because something's not firing right. the way oh, it yeah, should Oh, yeah, it's going to work great for a while. You're going to, like, just they kind of make gains and make progress. But, yeah, like you said, at some point, it's going to be like all right, this isn't really quite working or, you know, things are starting, things are starting to like show up, you know, weaknesses and, and like kind of faults in my technique. And now I really got to like figure out, um, why. Well, the, the one thing that I've always wondered with that is <clears throat> learning how to strain aside 
right? Because I would say even with those protocols, as a beginner, you really aren't really learning how to strain because you're you're going to break down right. before you can actually really strain. Yeah. Like you're going to miss before you can grind because yeah. the technique's not established. Right. So I've often wondered that what if instead of that, you know, they work the muscle groups and the accessories that they're supposed to, that will make those lifts stronger. But then as they're warm up, every time they go in the gym, they're just using a 25 pound bumper and doing multiple sets of squat bench and deadlift every time they come in. Yeah. So not enough right. to fatigue them, but practice yeah. like you did when you were a gymnast, right, right? Right. you're just practicing the lifts. Yeah. As your warm up, yeah. instead of walking on a treadmill or riding mm -hmm. the bike or whatever dumb shit they're doing for their warm up, yeah. as a circuit, right? You know, just to. I tend to think that would probably be more effective and yeah. work faster, yeah. Because it wouldn't just be three. You know, you'd be working all three lifts all days, right? On technique, yeah. So let's try it. Let us know how it is. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I, the reason I, I, if I have somebody that's struggling with technique, that's a low intermediate mm -hmm. i'll have them do that because yeah. at that point it's like well what what point is it really in doing like hanging leg raises and glute hand raises as a circuit to warm up yeah now when they just suck at the lifts yeah where what's a weight that they can it, the key thing is they have to mentally practice the technique right 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 otherwise this can go south yeah very fast which would be a criticism against those other programs right yeah because is the technique really being worked if all they're really worried about is i need to do five fives yeah yeah or whatever it's going to be yeah you know and we see the video right. you see the video and there there's no technical reps being done right you know at all yeah. they just get stronger at bad technique mm -hmm. where there's a better way yeah you know, have good technique and get stronger and yeah. then combine the two. For sure. Um, and, you, and you brought up a good point about, you know, you know, mentally practicing. I mean, visualization is huge. You mm -hmm. know, if you're not visualizing the lift, you know, I mean, I mean, all the time, I mean, visualizing like at home before you go to bed, whatever, like, you know, it's, just, it's, it's something to me that was just like kind of innate. Like I just always was thinking about it and like going through cues and kind of visualize, like literally imagining the weight, like, where am I feeling it during that point in my lift or whatever? And I think that helps with, you know, muscle engagement and mind muscle connection. That's a good point that you make there too, because what, and I'm sure you've had these conversations as well. People don't know how to do that. Yeah. So then they ask you, and I think it was Jan Blakely that said one time that basically just tell them you're already doing it. It's called daydreaming Yeah. and start there. Right. You know, because they're doing it as they're driving to the gym. Yeah. They're kind of thinking about what they want to do and how yeah. they want to do that. Just do it more frequently. Right. And yeah. then over a period of time, you'll be able to start to actually see it. Mm -hmm. And then it can get really weird. Yeah. I mean, it's, I'm taking from your response that you've gone deep into the rabbit hole of visualization. Yeah. You know, where there's funky shit that can happen. Yeah. You know, bars spinning off your back and <laughs> just let it go. I know. You know, I just, know. it's like, whatever, <laughs> let it go. Repeat it again, repeat it again. I'm a, big proponent of that yeah because it's i don't believe your mind knows the difference right you know i mean there's a lot of studies about that yeah yes. so <laughs> and that's all technical reps too yeah you know but people don't have the maybe they kind of are doing it in a way if they're scrolling through instagram looking at other people's lifts yeah. maybe mm -hmm. but i think it could be better right than what that is right i think that's a big shortfall that the typical e excuse i guess that we mm -hmm. would get is Oh, I've tried that and it doesn't work. Right, right. Like, what, what do you mean? Yeah. What, what do you mean you've tried? Yeah, yeah. I don't. No, there's no way. It mm -hmm. works. It works mm -hmm. if you're doing it right and doing it, doing it frequently enough. And um, yeah, if you believe in, I mean, belief in what you're doing is, you know, probably one of the most important thing, you know. Well, it's, it's interesting because it goes back to this theme of being all into something. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> sometimes you don't know. You know, if you really were all in until you're actually later in your career and look back yeah. and think, well, I was all in just on the things I really liked. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But I wasn't all in on the things I didn't like. Right. So it was just a ton of things that I did. Yeah. I yeah. I mean, it was easier for me to just take more <laughs> shit than it was to actually eat the way I was supposed to eat to recover. But I was all in with all that, except yeah. for that or yeah. whatever it's going to be. Right. Right. And 
so you, then you have to question whether that person's really all in because being all in would be doing everything that you can do to be able to get to yield the highest performance. Definitely. Which, which would be the visualization. I mean, how's that going to hurt? Right. Well, right. And say, just accountability. Like, I mean, people just saying like, you know, if some, if they're, if you're having a bad day in the gym or if you have a bad meet, like can, can do you ever look at yourself and say, you know, what, what you know, like we can do it now, like mm -hmm. 10 years ago and be like, Oh, I know I could have done this or that, but can people really truly do that and say, you know, they, everybody's, you know, to say like, it's oh, it's the programming, you know, that messed me up or the, my coach or whatever. But it's like, you know, did you really do all the work? Did you sleep enough? Did you eat right? Did you hydrate? Did you, um, do all these, you know, all these things, you know, there, I just see less and less accountability. How were you years. with that? Cause it's the way I was with that is it was, it was extreme. Yeah. Like if it didn't go well, I could tell you a million things that yeah. I screwed up Yeah. and probably was unhealthy to the degree. Right. But then <clears throat> through that process, I would go through and try to figure out which are the most important. Right. Right. And for then, sure. cause there's a lot. I mean, if you're really honest with yourself, there's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and if you're like I was, there's more than a lot. And, but then to kind of, were you that way or so were you? I always was like, you know, like you said, to a fault, almost maybe too hard on myself. Yeah. I'm like, I know that I, um, ate like crap. I, you know, there, I, I could always like pinpoint a million things that I could have done better. And I just thought that it would be okay. And they would all work out on meet day. And, um, and it didn't always. And, you know, nowadays people have, everybody's got a coach and, you know, a program and stuff like that. So they're, they're re basically relying, like I'm paying you, so I better have a good day. And it's like, well, there's still a level of accountability there too, you know? So it's like, it's just, it's, it's rough. Well, there is, there's a huge level because I, I know with the clients that you work with personally, that one of your main objectives is to be able to have them to become self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. So I would call that to learn how to auto-regulate yeah. their own training. Right. So then as they're going through their training, you're not really telling them, they're asking you questions. Yeah. You know, it's, should I, I think I should do, yeah. and then you got to process and say, yeah. that's exactly right. right. That's where you want them totally. to be. Totally. I totally, right? I, I don't, yeah, I want you to like, yeah, learn about yourself and like, you know, help me help you, you know, like yeah. I, I'm, I'm one person. I can, I'm not like a mind reader. I can't like, you know, yeah, absolutely. I know. Jack, but it. so those were, that's where the limitations will come if you're just doing a program or even if it's an online coach, unless the client, athlete, however you want to define that, is taught how to better communicate with their coach. Yeah. Because yeah. most coaches I know, and I don't know uh, shitty coaches, so it's, yeah. there's a lot of shitty coaches. I get that. But right. They're not in my yeah. circle. They want to help. Yeah. Right. But at the same time, they're not, like you said, you're not mind readers. Right. You know, so then it kind of falls on the accountability of the client to be able to learn how to ask better questions. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, instead of just sending a video or whatever it's going to be, you know, for them to send a video with maybe their own analysis mm -hmm. before you see it. Totally. You know, and so what would be some suggestions that you would have coming from a coaching side that if the clients were, what they could do to make them better? clients yeah. right and better accountability slash without sending you a dissertation yeah. right, after every right, training session right. because then that's you yeah. know more than what you need yeah what I, I mean, could I they just, do i just think being like you said being aware um you know because they know their body more than better than anyone so it's like do, do they notice patterns where it's like okay um you know, I didn't have a great day today, but like, I think, you know, you know, just giving suggestions, like, like the, your coach might not always like take that suggestion. They might, you know, be like, I kind of like, I'm doing it because of this or whatever. But a lot of times I love when uh, my clients are like, you know, have like have suggestions about like, you know, this happened, but like, I know it's because of this and I can, and then I can make adjustments, you know? So it's like just being open and honest is, is so important. And then just like, also just putting faith into, into what you're doing, like do the best you can. And, and like, and also to just know that it, it helps, like it would help me so much sometimes if people, if they have a bad day, just to brush it off, you know, mm -hmm. brush it off and know that like, of course we would love every single training day to be perfect, but just know that you are a human and things, you know, things happen. Like you're going to have a bad day, but you probably trace it back to, you know, something, you know, like, you know, this week's been stressful at work or like I've had really bad sleep, you know, a lot of times, like, 
you know, now that I like track my sleep hygiene, it's just like, man, I wonder how I was sleeping back then, you know, like, or if I was sleeping enough, you know, there's, I think sleep is like the, the greatest drug there is, you know, and I think that people just do not take that as seriously as they should, you know, um, and I think that I, I have some lifters that really take sleep seriously and they do really well. They recover so much better. So it's like all these little factors where it's just like, just be open and honest with, with your coach about what's going on, like in your personal life and, um, you know, and just, and be aware of that too. And know that like, that's going to play a factor into your training, just like, and also go into your training, knowing not that you should go into it saying like, Oh, I've had bad sleep. So I'm probably going to do bad today. It's like, no, just go into it, do, you know, and just say like, and, and be open and honest. You might have to contact your coach and say like, I have had a very bad week, you know, of whatever's going on. Like, and then your coach might say like, okay, let me adjust the, this training. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't want my athlete to like, just like have a horrible week of stress and this and that. And like, and then just, just do the program as it's written and then have a terrible day. And then now mentally there, it's just like snowballs. I'd rather them contact me and say, you know, it's probably not a good idea that I hit this, uh, one rep max, you know, like if we're, we are testing like a single mm -hmm. or something, it's like, it's like, I'd rather move it, you know, make adjustments, you know, it just, cause I want, I want, you know, positive flow. I want them to have a positive mindset. I don't want, I don't, you know, cause it, it's just infectious, you know, once, once I see it happen a lot, you know, if they aren't open and honest with the coach and like things, you know, might have a bad workout here, a bad workout there. And then next thing you know, it's like, it's just like, it's like a cancer. It just doesn't stop. And then they're looking over here and saying, well, so-and-so's, um, over here doing this program with this coach and they're just like, you know, I can, I can always tell when it's coming on. I know it, I can feel it. You know, when people have their eye, they have a wandering eye and it's like, it's like, if you, if you're like, if you're doubting it, just, just go on and go, just mm -hmm. go on and go. Because like, if you're doubting it, like, it's not going to get any better. Like if you are, if you don't have accountability, you don't have, you know, full faith in, in what you're doing and in your coach, then just, I mean, just do both of you guys a favor and just like, and just like move on. But I, I do wish it more people would, I mean, find, and find a program that you believe in. I, I like, I know back when I was competing, like there wasn't like, it wasn't like it is today mm -hmm. where there's like online programming and all this stuff going on. But like, I still think that I was, I was like hundred percent. Like I love the conjugate method. I loved training. I couldn't have ever imagined like, like, cause I bombed out. I mean, most people only know about like, like all the world records and all the success, but they don't know that I bombed out more times than I can even remember, <laughs> you know, literally like I had plenty of bad needs, plenty of bad workouts, but I still, at the end of the day, at the end of my career, cause I had patience, um, still have a career that I'm proud of. Well, I think that um, regardless of the program, assuming that it's solidly put together. Yeah, right. right? Yeah. So I mean, I'm not saying assuming, like, just assuming, like yeah, <laughs> assuming it's solidly put together, um, the athlete's still going to end up having to be, having to learn how to auto-regulate their yeah, training, right. no matter what it is, Yeah, you know? So, and that's that communication point, but it's also the ability to make, I guess you call game-ready decisions. Mm -hmm. So say a max effort day and you beat your five-pound PR, easy yeah well there's a decision to be made there yeah. you know do you take yeah. another one or do you do back down sets you know or do you just go on to the accessories but it's more than just that because you got to be able to process well if i take another one then i strain really hard mm -hmm. it's it may not impact you know my accessories for that day but it could but it's going to impact my bench Friday, yep. you know so it's systemically going to impact what goes on down the line. So right. you got to balance, is that worth that or not worth right. that? And that's where a good coach can kind of help you learn how to balance that. Because yeah. maybe you do do it, but then you have to change. Yeah, then we can adjust. It might be like a workout where it's like, like, yeah, that moved really easily. And like, this is like a good tester type of exercise. I do want you to take another one, like go ahead and take another one. And then, yeah, we can adjust the rest of the week, you know, accordingly, mm -hmm. but yeah, for sure. Like something like that is because if really they important. take that, maybe their confidence then yeah. goes through the roof yeah. and it's worth the trade. Oh, totally. You know, where, but it has to be balanced out through the week. Right. Right. And that's, irregardless of any program. Yeah. Yeah. And, and too, like being okay with your coach making adjustments. Sometimes like it, people see, cause I, you know, I program ahead quite a ways and it's like, you know, but knowing that it's like, okay, we can make changes, but sometimes people do not want to make changes. They see what's on Wednesday and they're like, I want to do that. And they're like, and you know, they, but I also want to do this extra set over here, you know? So they kind of like struggle with a coach saying like, no, we're, I, okay, I want to change Wednesday and not have you like hit one rep max, you know, something like mm -hmm. that. And they're just, 
they're not cool with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just being okay with like, just trust your coach, you know. How did you manage the the bad meets and the bad training days? Because it's, you got to have a short memory, totally. but I'm sure you didn't always. Yeah. You know? I, I think I was, I think I actually had a pretty good short memory. Like I, there, there are times I bombed out that maybe for five or 10 minutes, I was really, you know, bummed out of it. I remember being really bummed out one time because I thought I, because I had had a few in a row and I just remember like, I, I was upset after that, like, like maybe third one in a row. And I was like, am I like, is that it? Like, am I done? I was actually like, dang. But for the, for the most part, if it happened like once in a while, um, it was just like, you know, it, I mean, it could be anything like it, you know, as a woman, it could be like, you know, during the worst part of your cycle for that month. I mean, there's just so many things that can like affect how you feel that one day. I mean, we all know that, like how many times have you had a workout where just unexplainably like that felt incredible today. And then the next one, or like just a random one just feels absolutely horrible. And you just cannot pinpoint why it's like the same thing could happen on meet day. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you might just have a day where it's just like, <clears throat> who knows what it is. Or yeah. the days you don't even want to do it at all. Yeah, right. And you exactly. got to figure that out too. Yeah, like, like, you know, is this in my head? Do I need to do this? Do yeah. I not need to do this? Yeah. Those again, fall back to those game ready decisions that, right. you know, you do this long enough, there's going to be a lot of times you're going to go in there where you just don't want to do right. what you're supposed to do. Yeah. It's just a matter of how you, how you walk away from that. Like, you know, some people are in it for a short time, you know, they know, like, I, I want to get in and get out and you know, I'm only going to do this for a few years. You know, I, I just never really had that mindset. And I knew I wasn't going to do it forever. Like, but, um, I was just, I don't know. I just, I never felt like a hurry, you know, to, or like, like, just like all was lost. If I had one bad meet, you know, it was like, all right, it's just, go back to the drawing board, continue training. Like, as I said, I like, love training. So it's like, I'm only going to get stronger and I'll just, um, you know, kind of figure out, like, just kind of analyze what happened. That kind of brings up as a good thing to discuss there is because people have a hard time trying to conceptualize long-term programming. I mean, to most long terms, 12, 16 weeks. Yeah. Right. Where long term would be multi year. Right. And one way I like to navigate that conversation with people is where well, now it's kind of easy because the pandemic was four years ago, like four years and two months ago. Does that seem like it was just yesterday? It doesn't seem like it was no. four years ago. No. So it goes that fast. Yeah. So when you say, you know, you're committed to the sport, you know, so you're beyond this, I'm going to try it out phase. So now you're committed. Are you committed for four years? Yeah. People are like, oh God, they freak out. That's yeah. so long. I'm like, well, the pandemic <laughs> was like yesterday. Right. It, it's kind of fast, ago, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and you've already committed to things before because you graduated high school and that was four years. Right. You know, you graduated, if you went to college, that, that could have been four to eight years yeah. or more, you know, so you can commit to a long-term thing. Right. So right. don't tell me you can't, <laughs> right. you already have. Yeah. Um, you finished grade school, you know, so that was 12, <laughs> you know, so... It's there, um, but they got to get past this, I want to try it out mm -hmm. phase, which most lifters seem to get past pretty quick. Mm -hmm. They may be lying. Right, right. But once they get past that, I think their mindset kind of has to fall into this, I'm in this for the long run. They may not know what that's going to be. Yeah. You'll know if you do it long enough when the last few years are coming. Right, right. You'll worry about that then. Yeah, right. It's not you now. Yeah. But I think if they look at it more from a quadrennial standpoint, then they're going to be more willing to fix weak points, more willing to fix technique. Right. They're not going to be in this huge rush. Yeah. And it, it doesn't work that way anyhow. Yeah. Well, for some, like the outliers, it will. Yeah. And that sucks. Right. Right. Um, it sucks when, you know, people come in you know, weaker than you, then two years later, yeah. they surpass you, but yeah. that's life, you know? Yeah. Some people are, you know, also just gifted. Yeah, know? but you can't control that. Yeah, exactly. You can control you, Yeah. right? And if they took that more broader lens, mm -hmm. then maybe they wouldn't program hop, coach hop, right. and all these other things, because it's going to take a coach a while to figure you out yeah. too. Yeah. Some people just take longer and, and that's okay. You just have to, yeah, you just cannot, you just stay in your lane. Don't worry about what other people are doing around you. Just focus on you and getting better every time. That's all you can do. Mm -hmm. How were you able to do that? How was I able mm -hmm. to? I mean, I would like at that time I wasn't really competing against anyone. There weren't like a lot of females in the sport. So it was like, I just had to learn how to compete against myself, you know? So it was literally like every workout was just how, how can I, 
you know, get better at this movement that I'm doing? How can I, you know, get stronger at this to help get stronger in the meet? And I really was just chasing my own, my own numbers. You know, so it was just, that's all I could really do. I couldn't really like. Yeah, but there's downsides <laughs> to that too, right? Because now you got to, it's, nobody's pushing you at that yeah. point. Yeah. Right. You, you never know. I guess you could have the paranoia. Yeah. So but, it would just come out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. Which, I mean, you did. I mean, so, it, I mean, it's, it's possible. So, yeah. but that's not as hard to navigate. Yeah. And then if it's just you by yourself. Right. You know, so when you're chasing the numbers. Right, and that's all you got to chase. Then you have that bad meat, yeah. right? And then that's a hard pill to swallow. Right. I mean, I I kind of like uh since I since I didn't have like people that I was actually competing against for you know for the most part, um I just yeah if I would have a bad meat, it was more like gosh did I let Louis down? Did I let you know these people that are watching me at the meet? You know I just was like you know it took a while it took a lot of people like you know George and my training partners that would be like you know everybody no matter what like people nobody's disappointed nobody's you know gonna like not want to watch you anymore or anything like that you know everybody when people see i think people think that they, they think that people are judging them up on the platform and just being like oh that was terrible or they had a bad meet and it's like no they they genuinely like just want to see you come back and get it so i mean i i was always ready to just like i cannot wait for the next one um you know, I think in, in the beginning I was doing like sometimes four meets a year. Cause I just, I just loved competing. I loved training and competing. And then, then it came down to like a couple meets a year, but, um, but yeah, that was, I mean, that was definitely tough. Cause it's like, um, it was just, yeah, it was just me against me. And, and if I had a bad meet, then it was like, all right, I gotta get motivated to, to get back and just compete against me again. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> it probably would have been so much more fun today you know, going, like if I was getting ready for the pro-am or something like that, you know, where there's, you know, so many strong and talented females, it, it's unreal. Like it, it would have been, who knows? I mean, would I have been a different lifter? Would I have done different numbers? I, I don't know, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you still found other external factors to drive oh, you. Oh yeah, for sure. Right. So and that that would be the difference if it's just you chasing the numbers, then that, that's rough. But yeah. now it's you, in your own head. You don't want to let these people down because if you do that, it's terrible. Yeah. Right. So then that becomes, right. you know, a, another external stimulus to yeah. kind of push. I mean, I grew up doing gymnastics, so it was like I was kind of weird because this is so not my personality but i was like kind of like a performer and um you know did the dance team and stuff like that so to me it was just like i'm performing for these people and i remember before i even like started competing going to the arnold and going and watching um the, the wpo when it was in that big room mm -hmm. and like when chuck came out like watching every single person stand up you know every single person i was like i want that you know like mm -hmm. i want to do something and it wasn't like i was like i want the attention it was more yeah. like i want to do something that just brings people to their feet so i like you know that was an external factor that that kind of motivated me too it was just like i want to stand up on the platform and have everybody stand up because they're like a woman is doing this you know like that's really mm -hmm. that's something that drove me a lot too what keeps you in this around the sport now um I, I just, I don't, some, I just want to like give back in some way. I, I'm just, you know, I want to like help other people, you know, learn from the mistakes that I made, you know, but also make this a place, you know, that's more, you know, friendly to power lifters, especially female power lifters. That's why, you know, running the, the pro-am is important to me. You know, I've, you know, I've given up the other meets that I've, that I host and just put my effort into this one because it's just like, I see what it means to people and like the experience that they have. And like, it's so, I mean, that's why I stay awake at night and I can't sleep because I'm thinking about like the meet and like, cause I want to make sure everybody has a good experience. I don't want to be the reason that someone, you know, that I, I mess up something with the meet planning and they, someone doesn't have a good experience. I want everybody to have a good experience. So that they, you know, um, have that opportunity to compete against other people and, um, an, an environment that's fun and friendly and inclusive and encouraging. And, um, you know, that I just, it's like literally like, you know, something, you know, more so than like world records, it's probably my, like my proudest like accomplishment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With, <clears throat> you mentioned earlier that, you know, lifters coming up, they don't put enough attention into the sleep, right? Mm -hmm. So we talked about training a lot. We talked about all these other things, but outside of the sleep, what are other variables that they're not putting attention into that will help with the recovery? Because you have to recover from the stimulus, right? Right. You need to train hard, right? Which we already established that 
on yeah. accessories. Most people don't. Yeah. But that increases the stimulus, but then they have to recover from that. Mm -hmm. So where do you see shortfalls there? Well, over time, if you know, if they're consistently doing their accessory work and you're going to build a work capacity, that's huge. Like, cause if you, like you said before, like if someone's like, oh, I didn't do accessories this one day and then I had a really good, the next, you know, and then there's thinking like, if I do less, I actually feel better. But in the long run, you're just lowering your work capacity. So, you know, doing accessory work, you know, building that work capacity, but sleep, nutrition, um, you know, I know we came from the day where it was just like eat. I mean, luckily I came for power from bodybuilding. So I did eat kind of like a bodybuilder, but I ate so much junk on top of that, that I'm just mm -hmm. like, man, if I just would have like been a little bit better about that. Um, I, you know, I was probably inflamed all the time, you know, from eating so much sugar and crap, you know, that it's like, would I have felt a lot better? Would I have been able to recover better? Had I not put, you know, so much of that into, into my body. So focusing on nutrition, you know, did I drink enough water? I don't even know, you know, like I don't, you know, remember, mm -hmm. you know, did I ne definitely didn't ha drink any electrolytes, you know? Mm -hmm. So on the sweaty summer training days, I was probably like just losing so many electrolytes. Um, and you know, had no clue, you know, why I would feel like crap the next day, you know, like probably feel like you're hungover. <laughs> um, no, you're right. From no. sugar, no yeah, electrolytes. Yeah. I'm dehydrated. Um, definitely probably didn't sleep enough, you know, and, you know, now we know so much about sleep. It's like, you know, your circadian rhythms and keeping, making sure you like try to keep a consistent sleep schedule too is important. So like, not like going to bed, I'm going to go to bed at nine tonight, but tomorrow night I'm going to stay up till 12, you know, like, you know, having like consistent sleep schedule, that's really important too. Um, and you know, so sleep, nutrition, hydration, accessory work to build a work capacity to help for, for recovery. And then also like body work. So I know that's the, the, the barrier to that is, you know, having the money to do it. So I, I totally am aware of that, but it's like, if you can, you should be doing something, you know, there's no way that your body is just like firing on all, all cylinders and it's totally recovered and nothing's going on, you know? So, you know, as someone doing mobility. So if you're not doing mobility, are you getting with someone that can show you how to do mobility properly, you know, for your sport, that's important. You know, I, you know, I'm not talking like, I'm not talking stretching either. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about like stretching. I'm talking about, you know, mobility. So mobility, are you, you know, if you have some, you know, some, I mean, even, even things like massage, chiropractic, things like that. I mean, Louie was such a big proponent of restorative methods, you know, and it's true, like doing, you know, whatever it is that you find that works for you, like some sort of body work, um, is important too. Like, um, you know, we have a physical therapist, you know, she works on a lot of our people, you know, dry needling, things like that. So it's just like, there's so much that can be done to maintain your body. And if you're not doing anything, it's like, there's no way that your body's, um, like I said, just like, primed and ready to go yeah the um, the hydration made me laugh um, because i it made me think back to so many training sessions to where i mean there's no water fountain in there right <laughs> yeah. and so nobody's thinking to bring water right. in there and i'd have dry mouth and you're you can your shirts are you're going through shirts oh yeah you know because it's so freaking hot in there right and now you know i sit back and think at the time, I probably thought that was awesome. Yeah. You know, but it's so stupid, it's you know, to like, where, oh my God, <laughs> you know, if it's water with, you know, electrolytes or, you know, element sponsored, by the way, yeah. you know, <laughs> link in the description, <laughs> you know, you know, something like that. Oh my God. Right. You know, I can remember, you know, several times Louie would go to the Hajis, which was when we were on Dimmers, and then buy like a bag of Gatorade and bring it over, yeah. you know, after. And, like whatever you yeah. know it's it's like now i'm thinking it would have been nice you know it would have been better than nothing if we would have yeah. had it before right you know it's right. the extent of any intra or pre-workout would be like mountain dew you know or coffee <laughs> right. probably coffee more so more dehydrating right, exactly you know, pounding yeah. coffee while you're training yeah where we know better now right. um and i would hope that people know better now mm -hmm. but <clears throat> That cracked me up because it was there's no air conditioning either. No. So, and where you were at, there was no air conditioning nope. there. So the summers were brutal. Terrible. And there, the water fountain there, I don't even know if it worked or if there even was one. You'd yeah. stick your head under the faucet, maybe. Yeah. You know, and nobody was bringing in gallon jugs of water because you'd get razzed for doing that. Right. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so the the body work, the hydration, stuff like that, with um extra workouts, mm -hmm. you know, how do you put those in? 
Um, so it depends on the person if they, you know, do, you know, dot their, you know, dot their I's, cross their T's. And it's like, yeah, like have, doing a couple days of, you know, small workouts where it's just a very light, high rep, you know, banded, banded good morning, seated band leg curls or, you know, and or sled dragging. You know, that's a, a sled drag, dragging is a perfect, you know, workout to put in as your special exercise day. Um, you know, an upper body banded push down, you know, things like that. Then it, uh, bamboo bar bench presses are like super great to do. Very high rep, very lightweight, just, you know, to, for like an, an additional weight for a restorative method. Um, but some people like, you know, they're, I just know that adding that in will be too, that'll be too much. Like it'll, you know, they're barely recovering from the training. It's like, that's just going to put it over the edge. So it's like, I just don't put those in there. It's just a four day training week. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I wouldn't, so I don't put them in there sometimes, but you know, well, it, it can it be a little good. tricky though, too, because a lot of those movements that you're trying to put in there are just concentric only. Yeah. But if they make it to where it's not that, yeah, then it defeats the purpose. Right. Right. You know, or if the sled's too heavy, yeah. you know, and things like that where yeah, or bad technique on the sled work or, or whatever, but you know, sled dragging, you know, we know is really good for GPP. So, um, you know, but doing it, yeah, correctly, the right load, you know, you know, variation in your sled work, you know, then it, it is, it's really good. I, I love, love sled work. How would you determine the load? Um, I mean, it depends. I mean, cause actually every, every surface is different. So mm -hmm. like, you know, at West side, it was like a real slick black top. So it was like, mm -hmm. you really loaded up. And then like, you know, when we were at the sweatshop, it was like the concrete was like glue. It was like so sticky. You could maybe use half the weight. So I hesitate sometimes mm -hmm. to pr uh, program an actual like load for people like, Oh, you know, 50% of your deadlift or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, it's how much weight can you do with it? for this distance with good form, upright, marching, heel to toe, you're not leaning forward on your toes, you're, you know, so if you have good form and you can handle this weight, then yeah, by all means do it. So, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. There, it's, I can, took me a while to figure out where if it was on blacktop and it was raining, why it was so much harder because you would yeah. think it'd be easier. Yeah. It was too dumb to realize <laughs> that you don't have any grip with your shoes. Yeah, right, right. You know, so, <laughs> so I was like, what, what's going on here? Yeah with that but i to your point i think a lot of people will see those then think that their lack of progress is because they're not doing that mm -hmm. where the lack of progress is you know other recovery modalities totally. are just not they're just their work capacity is too low from their yeah. main stuff right right you know so which brings up when you're speaking about work capacity and this is one thing i can never really get from louie is you can indefinitely keep increasing your work capacity Right. So you do it long enough. Realistically, you with right hydration, nutrition, all that, you could train twice a day, yeah. every single day and build the work capacity for yeah. that. But at a certain point, the work capacity is unnecessary for what you need to yeah. do. Yeah. Like you know? it'd be one thing if you're a fighter or something like that, where it's just like, yeah, like your sport does require just, you know, that, that type of or CrossFit endurance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But like for powerlifting, it's like, yes, we want to build a work capacity within this, like, you know, this range here, you know, so being able to get through a workout, like a morning workout, that's, I mean, I kind of limit people. I'm like, it shouldn't be more than an hour and a half. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And, um, you should be able to fit everything. And if not, then come back and do the rest later, you know, um, break it into to two workouts if you have the capability to, um, but actually doing like a three hour workout is, uh, it's almost counterproductive for, you know, hormone wise. And, mm -hmm. you know, it just, you start to like your hormone levels start to drop so much. It's yeah. Like it's like, like kind of counterproductive. So it's like you, if you had the capability to break it into two workouts or do finish the rest as like special exercise the next day, you know, because usually the rest would be like abs and a finisher, you know, most, for the most part, you should probably be able to get through like the will, first will, three Will things. there be times through the year where you'll purposely let the work capacity drop, you know, to be able to pull it back up? Um, I mean, were you just trying to build maybe it? Maybe right and after the after it. the meet, like right yeah. after the meet, like a lot of, like the girls already have like their four weeks programmed after the pro am, and it's all like bodybuilding stuff. There's some like main movements, like maybe like a three rep max, something like close grip bench press or something like that. But it's all like bodybuilding style accessories, and all meant to be like kind of light, you know. So I'm, you know, would that be considered letting the work capacity drop or like like are the, are the main it? are the main lifts pulled out? Uh, I mean, there's belt squats, there's, there's still some deadlifting, but I mean, we're not doing, you know, 
a squat against yeah, chains so it's or anything down. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, usually right after a meet for a month, it's like pretty chill. And then we're right back into regular training. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With, um, with the growth of women's powerlifting over the past decade, right? Or whatever it's <laughs> been. I mean, it, I would say, guess it's, it's half powerlifting now or very close, yeah. maybe even more than half. Yeah. <clears throat> with that has also come you know, more prevalent use of, you know, PEDs and stuff like that, mm -hmm. which kind of fall in there, which brings up the conversation of um, <clears throat> when, you know, because I'll speak to women now sometimes that are like, what the fuck? Yeah. You know, it's, it's their first meet and yeah. they feel oh. like they have to do something. Right. Um, and I'm sure you've been in conversations like that as well, where male or female, it really doesn't matter. I, personally think people need to wait as long as they possibly right, should. Right, for sure, yeah. And, um, but with that growth and so many other people doing that, you know, how do you navigate those conversations? Because sometimes it's almost, you know, you're kind of in a losing battle, but you're still trying to fight it. Yeah. You know, because, you know, the net result will be greater. Yeah. If they wait longer. Yeah. But it's a, it's a hard battle. So how do you navigate those? Well, I mean, fortunately now there's like people that, can professionally guide people with, with stuff like that. So I have people that I, if someone says to me, like, like I want to do that and it's like, and, and they, you know, been, it's been long enough. That's their personal choice. Mm -hmm. And I will say, I do not know. I do not know enough about that to guide you, help mm -hmm. you anything. I'm like, here, like do it professionally. Like, do not do this. Like, well, just when you aimlessly. say it's been long enough, like how long should well, I mean, they? Just as if they, if they're not like brand new lifter, yeah. if, you know, if they've been training well, for a long time and that. they're not, I mean, <laughs> like if you're making progress and things are going great, like, why would you do that? You know? And, um, you know, and what, what are your long-term goals? Like, are you trying to, you know, hit some sort of, of, you know, big total world record, something like that, you know, like what's it worth to you? Cause I'm going to tell you what's going to happen, you know, when you do it and like, in our, it, you know, what's it worth to you? Is it, is it worth that? You know, like, you know, cause there are going to be, there are going to be things that happen that you're not going to like. And mm -hmm. like, you know, are you okay with that? Like, these are, these are things that women have to think about that men don't, you know? So it's like, um, you know, don't get caught up in like, you know, what you're seeing and all these, you know, big, strong lifters, they've are they're, you know, they probably have like, you know, professional people helping them, you know, they've made the decision and sacrifice to do that. And like, you know, like you have got to think about that before you, before you take that leap, you know, have you seen this scenario on the women's side? Because I've seen it on the men's side is <clears throat> if they pull that trigger too soon and, and meanwhile, there's other triggers they can pull. Like they can yeah. learn how to optimize their training, right. yeah. learn how to optimize recovery, yeah. nutrition. Yeah. Exactly. There's all these other things, <laughs> right. right? That they should learn before. Right. Right. Because either way, if they start soon, they're still going to have to learn how to optimize those things yeah. at a later, you right. know, because right. it's only going to take them so far. Yeah. Exactly. Then it's going to be, so that should go first mm -hmm. in there. But what I've found that if those don't go first in there, but the first trigger is the PEDs, then when that inevitable sticking point or stall happens yeah. their default is more shit yeah not yeah, right those other things are right. you seeing the same thing yeah should i add this in should i change this it's like you know yeah you're, you're totally right it's like you know that does not mean you should do more. It does not mean you should add more. You know, you've got to like look at these other factors and make sure you're doing all of this other stuff for recovery um, before you think about that. Because So know, that's what I worry yeah. about when they go on too soon, mm -hmm. because I've seen it so often and with the men that that just becomes a default. Yeah. I need more, yeah, I need yeah. more, I need more. I'm like, right. you know, actually it's all these other things, uh, Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, you know, you can keep taking more, but these things, these other things aren't even providing an environment for the drugs to actually do what they should do right. at a more optimal level Yeah. from that. And <clears throat> that, I think that gets lost in the conversation Yeah. is, is that piece that yes, this will definitely get you here. They yeah. work. We're not, yeah. I mean, there's no, no doubt that it's going to get you there, but eventually you still have to learn. Yeah. And I mean, right? I would definitely recommend people, you know, do it the right way. Like if you're going to do it, like hire, you know, get, get with the right people that are guiding people now. Cause I mean, there's so much you should be doing with like blood work and, you know, other, like, you know, just supplements you should be taking in addition, you know, like there's so many ways to optimize so that you don't have to take as much, um, you know, at least do that, at mm -hmm. least do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
What What are some of the other things that you're seeing that lifters are having a harder time with in today's world as opposed to when you came up? Um, I think just the accessibility to social media is making it. So it's like, it's like a highlight reel. Like these people are seeing other people, like you're only going to post, like no, nobody's posting their fails, you know, mm-hmm. rarely are people posting their fails or you know, things. So people are, you know, looking at what other people are doing and they're just hyper fixating on what they're not doing or how, you know, this person's, you know, doing this and they're not, or they're making this progress and they're not like, you know, it's, it's really hard. It's really, really, really hard. I, I cannot imagine if, if I would have had the, that kind of access. I didn't, I mean, the mm-hmm. only thing that, that I could look at was, um, like those message boards yeah. or something. And like, there weren't, you know, if there was a video on there, like it, that was rare, you know, it was just like, you, it was just a bunch of shit talking. It wasn't like, you know, seeing what everybody else was doing. I think that would, I would have struggled with that too, probably to like, see that. I think that's kind of like the first thing that comes to mind is, you know, that it's, how do you think you would have navigated that? that? Because it's, I still believe champions are going to rise to the top, yeah. no matter what the environment would be. Yeah. Um, how do you think you would have navigated that? I mean, it would have been hard, but I, I still think like it wouldn't have affected like my training or, you know, my desire to be the best in the world. Um, you know, I think nowadays it's just people might see something and be like, because I watch some of the, like the, like the top people that are now, and I'm just like, even I'm like, Oh, that person looks like they're going to, you know, so I can imagine these top people that are looking at each other. They're thinking like, cause everybody posts everything. Um, some people stay pretty quiet, but like if, if someone's posting a lot of stuff, I can see like, Oh, I wonder if so-and-so saw what they did. Um, but then you see, you see at the meet, it doesn't always pan out what, like the way it looked like it was going to with people posting stuff. So mm-hmm. it can be just like, I would just suggest people just don't look, you know, and if you're, if you're a, a lifter, like just, you know, maybe post something every once in a while, but I don't think that like, you know, you know, I, I would be someone probably that wouldn't post out everything and just reveal all of my cards all of the time, mm-hmm. you know? So, but as far as like people that, you know, are coming up, you know, it's like, I think they see stuff and, you know, I see these like younger people like that are like, I'm talking like teenage or like early twenties, you know, they're seeing what, um, John Hack is doing and then they're trying to mimic that, you know, it's like, you know, just to pick one thing, follow it and don't be so like, Oh, the so-and-so is doing that. I should be adding this in. Ah, they should be adding this in. You know, it's like, just pick something and get stronger and realize that those people are light years ahead of you as, as far as like training time, training, oh, yeah. maturity, muscle maturity, you know, there's so many things that are different about what they are doing. So just, yeah. Well, they're, two de- they're 10 or 20 years ahead. Right. Right. You know, so there's yeah. experience and all that. I think they forget that, right. You know, they'll see those things. And then if they happen to see somebody is around their same age, you know, that person may also have more years training, right? you know, or just be the outlier. You know, it's, it shouldn't impact their training. Yeah. So I would agree with no, what you're exactly. saying there a hundred percent. Yeah. You know, if they can look at it as entertainment yeah. and just keep it at that. Right. Then or I should be doing his program. It's like, uh, you know, like, yeah, like they, they build, he's built a work capacity to be able to like hit a heavy single pretty frequently, you know, mm-hmm. like you just cannot, yeah, you have to take that, all of those factors into account. Yeah. I think the, the program hopping has always been a thing, mm-hmm. but it's, it's more rapid just because everything's faster. Right. You know, before it would, you would, most would finish the 12 week ebook. Yeah. You know, then jump to the other 12 week ebook now or whatever it was so going to be. There's so much to choose from that it's like, oh, I'll just go over here and try this. Yeah. You know? Where I can understand why they get confused. But if there's any message I keep trying to put out there is the end's still the same. Yeah. You have to learn how to regulate your own self. Right. You know, to be able to progress forward. Yeah. And if you look across everybody that's at the top or everybody that's been at the the top that's the only factor that's universal yeah. across all of them right, you know right. outliers not outliers all of them yeah but yeah. obviously people don't like to look for that yeah. they want to know what exercise to do yeah you know because yeah. of their bench i need to get the strongest i can the fastest that i can mm-hmm. yeah. and i <laughs> i understand that because yeah. i'm sure yeah. you were that way i mean we're yeah. all kind of that way to right, a degree right. i mean but there's also reality yeah you know that if you're Benching 200 pounds, you're probably not going to be benching 500 pounds right, in right. Yeah. six months. Yeah, definitely having um, realistic expectations. I mean, I, I think that's something to, to add to that where, you know, think, things that I see nowadays that, um, is that, you know, just having realistic ex- expectations. I think sometimes people like 
I mean, that's really hard as a coach too. When someone comes in and says like, this is what I'm expecting. And like, like, do I go with that? And like, cause I don't want to, um, you know, in any way, shape or form, like bring down their confidence because they're confident that they can do that. Or do I say like, that's not realistic for this meet, you know, but maybe in the future, that is such a hard line to, to, mm-hmm. to choose. It's like, do I, which way do I go? You know, cause I got to say like, cause I know, I know I'm like, that's, that's not going to happen this time. I, that's not, that's definitely a good goal for the future, but not going to happen that time. And I don't, cause some people will take offense to that. They'll be like, there's, um, she's holding me back. Yeah, well, to to lean into my bias here a little bit on conjugate, this is, it's one of the beautiful things about conjugate as well is because her strength isn't as linear as people want to make it to be. Otherwise, we'd all be benching a thousand like, pounds or 2000 like, pounds. It can't work that it, way. It doesn't work that <laughs> right. way. It's like steps and yeah. stages, right? Yeah. You fix technique on one thing and you lock it in. That could add 50 pounds to your squat, but did it really? Right. You just displayed strength you already had better. Yeah. Right. 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 But when you have max effort stuff that's mechanically similar in a program, then you don't have to wait until a meet to determine what that new max is going to be. Right, right. Because you already know this; these movements are 90% or relatively yeah. very close to what my main movement is. Yeah. So then you as the coach can say, holy shit, yeah. this technical change made a huge difference. Yeah, we can so, expect more now. Yeah, yeah, now maybe we can increase the speed work or whatever it's going to, the percentage is there. Right. Because you have that constant check yeah. to be able to see. So realistically, you can progress faster. Yeah. You know, because of that, because otherwise you can't be maxing out on other programs all the time. Right, right. And that's, to me, one of the biggest benefits of conjugate, especially for intermediate or beginners, because they're going to progress at very weird rates. Yeah. Very weird. Definitely. You know, it's, especially with their squat technically just sucks. You know, that you yeah. fix that, that could put 200 pounds. Right. On a, and again, they didn't get stronger. Yeah. They just displayed their strength more yeah. efficiently. Exactly. And Some people's technique changes and, and you fix their technique through accessories too. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's just like, uh, this is bad technique, but it's not, there's no, nothing I can do to technically change them today. You know, we have to work on these things, you know, through accessory work to make them, uh, to make their technique better. Oh, that's a, that's a yeah. good point. That's a very underrepresented point yeah. as well. Because they just don't have either the isometric strength right. or usually it's the isometric strength to hold the position yeah, right. or mobility, you right. know, whatever yeah. it's going to be, Exactly. you know, but it's something, you know, so it's, yeah. that's the other thing where if you have to wait, you know, six months to be able to test yeah. and everything's, ba- it's just like, like yeah, what, no. what you, that's why I have a bias, I suppose. Yeah, but right. Were there any topics you wanted to talk about I didn't bring up? I don't think so. That was... The yeah, cookies, man. We got to talk about the cookies because oh, yeah. I'm going to eat them afterwards. I'm going to my post table talk meal. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> my well, my mom owned a, a cookie shop for many years, and she started that when I was, I think, in college. Well, she she had been making them since I was little, and she had like the secret recipe. And um, so I watched her. She, you know, she started. Yeah, she started that business. She started at the farmers market, and then owned her own store for many years, and voted best cookie in Cincinnati. And um, you know, all my sisters knew the recipe because they worked there. But then, uh, recently she just decided she was going to teach me how to make them. And so I've been like, this was like not that long ago. So I've just been like obsessively trying, that's like my, been my stress relief lately. It's like, okay, I'm like so stressed about the meat and all this stuff I've got to do. It's like, I'm going to take an hour and make a batch of cookies and try to get them right. Cause it's like, you know, I would have thought that, okay, I know the recipe now they're just going to turn out perfectly, but it's been trial and error and I think I'm getting it pretty good. So I made a bunch of them recently, um, for, and I, they're in the freezer to take out for the podium winners for the mm-hmm. meet. So, so I just made a, ba- a batch yesterday. So I brought you some. Yeah. No, I appreciate <laughs> I, it. I call it my exit strategy. Cause I'm like, Oh, maybe one day it'll be like, all right. No, we'll sit down. We'll this. be talking about your cookie empire with, you yeah. know, a thousand yep, locations. There we go. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll still program for people. Yeah. Though, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, how can people find you? Uh, qu- at queen B power on Instagram or at team QBP team queen B power team QBP on Instagram. That's where I put a lot of training videos and and information about training, um, or queenbeepower.com. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And do you have any final thoughts? I don't think so. Hopefully I'll see everybody next weekend, uh, at the, well, April 13th and 14th at the Butler County fairgrounds for the women's pro-am. Uh, I know I'm biased, but it's a, it's an awesome, awesome meet and it's the lifters who make it awesome. I mean, something about it. Like I always wonder, I'm like, is this year going to be the same? Is it still going to be the same energy? And every single year, these ladies like bring in, in, 
unbelievable energy to the room. I mean, I, everybody that comes is just like, that was super cool. So even if someone's like interested in powerlifting, come check it out. Um, it's in Hamilton down by Cincinnati. And if not, then, um, on the live stream on, on our, on, in my bio or at the team, Q, Q, team QBP bio, um, you can find the live stream link. It's on, it's on my page too, on, on Instagram as well. You'll see one of the posts that has a live stream link link. We have a really good live stream so you can watch the lifters from afar. So, um, yeah, I'm super excited. I'm, I'm going into, I'm always stressed out. I'm always like, you know, worried something's going to go wrong, but I swear this year I'm going to be like, okay, I'm going to enjoy this experience. Cause afterwards, whenever it's done, I'm like, that was incredible. Mm -hmm. So awesome. You know? So I'm like, okay, I'm just going to like really, enjoy it this time <laughs> i'll be there so i'll remind you like, yeah, like, take a okay, breath take a breath, take a breath chill out <laughs> yeah, okay well i want to thank you for coming thank out you it's so been much. great it's super fun. um i'll see you in a couple weeks awesome. and we're done awesome thank you all right guys this is how i use my element packs i got a few different ways that i use it and so currently just got done training so Post training, I will mix one of the chocolate. This is the chocolate caramel and my oatmeal. I'm more of a half packet guy. So put about a half a packet in there and then stir it around. Then it adds that salty chocolate taste to it. If for some reason I'm using chocolate protein in my oatmeal, then I won't put that in there. I'll put a half pack in my coffee, which I'm not gonna do now, but the chocolate mocha is really good in the coffee. And then for training, <clears throat> when I trained earlier today, it's simply, my favorite is the grapefruit salt. Pretty much just a, you know, a half pack in there and then and reseal the packs and then put them in and then so for training you know i'll have a half a pack and then half a pack of the oatmeal so it's about a pack a day if i'm sweating really bad during training then i might use a full pack in there but the go-to for me is the oatmeal because it's an everyday thing Dave Tate's a very strong individual. I did not work out, but I did scope out the equipment scene there, of course, because I'm a huge purchaser of Elite. Matt Goodwin, the equipment rep, the main equipment rep there, I've known for years, helped us out tremendously. He's part of my dream team, and the bigger you get, the more equipment you're going to need. You got, so whether it's a high school, personal training facility, a garage gym, we've got years and years of experience on building these things out and laying them out and designing them and making sure you're buying the things that you need and not necessarily the things that you will never use. He's my guy. The bigger you get, the more equipment you're going to need, obviously, to outfit these facilities and the more they need to be upkept, the more they need to be replaced. And it actually becomes a problem for us. That doesn't really happen um, without guys like Matt. So myself, Nate Harvey, Chris Bartle, we've got years of experience. Chris and Nate have both been strength coaches, um, business owners. We can help you guys in any aspect of your gym build. So never hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, there's a contact us page on the website. All of our information's on there. You can reach me directly at mgoodwin at elitefts.net. The phone number here is 888-854-8806. And we can answer any questions you guys have. I'm, t I'm talking to him more and more, especially as we continue to grow and expand. and. It's something to consider. So I'm really pumped to have the story come full circle for sure. So feel free to reach out to us at any time. We're always here to help and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Why should anyone join this Discord? Why wouldn't you want to? It's not fake. It's genuine. It's authentic. It's well worth it. The Discord has been nothing short of meeting new people who are incredibly like-minded, giving each other a bunch of ball busting, but also being there to support each other in whatever life throws their way. The best part of it for me has also been able to connect with lifters of all levels, help coach, get coached, and also connect with other new fathers who are enjoying the journey of lifting and trying to balance that out. It's the glue that holds all of us together. A common interest will bring people from different walks of life people who are multi-millionaires, these characters and everything else in between, united under one thing, the pursuit of strength. I think most of us would agree that getting a coach is a great step forward that an athlete can make to make greater progress. But what if you had two coaches? What if you had a whole bunch of coaches 
and a whole bunch of driven elite level athletes and like-minded people all in your corner trying to make you better. That's exactly what you're going to get with the Table Talk Discord crew.